Everybody, um, to learning day, um, to learning day, um, there's a bit of a learning curve. I thought I could just set up, um, the stream and have to start automatically this morning, and it didn't do that. Apparently, I need streaming software specifically for that. So, sorry for the slight delay, it's um, put me a little bit behind this morning. So I'm going to mute and start in about five, 10 minutes as I settle some of this nonsense. Let me put up a little note saying that. Uh, give me five bibs. And here I am. All right. Um, yeah, one of the things I just discovered is um, if you want to set up, it looks like I could be wrong, but this is my confusion here. It looks like if I want to set up the stream a day in advance, I have to do it through specific streaming software. I can't do it through my webcam like I'm doing now. Um, so it just it took me a while to sort it out. I thought, oh, everything's ready to go. How do I go live? I don't go live because I don't have OBS or something like that in uh, um, setting this up. Um, I'm probably just going to um, do this tomorrow as well, just set up and then put the links out as soon as I'm ready to go. Um, and then before I do an event like this again, I will um, study down at OBS or something similar and get ready to go through that platform so I can actually do all the preamble work. 
So uh, today I'm starting off finishing the Shredder and Hell piece um, that I worked on yesterday. You can you can see. I mean, there's there's gonna be some stuff that either I could pull the camera way back to show the whole image. Um, it's a pretty big piece. It's uh, it's the single finger single finger single finger single figure uh, background at my discretion uh, option. It's not like the cover quality art. Um, so that's where I'm starting with, with this. Now I'm going to be doing mostly special effects with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take it off my, uh, I have this drawing board thing I made. It's, it's replacing my original. So it has the 90 degree corner already built in. So it has the bottom lip that holds my art when it doesn't curve up at the bottom. It's very shallow. Hang on. Here we go. So it catches this and it can hold a set square, one of these pieces readily so I can just slide it around up and down all I need and it just speeds up the work and it means I can actually work in like coffee shops and something with very little additional effort but because I'm going to be doing a whole lot of uh special effects stuff and I don't want the handling edge of the artboard to get wrecked I'm going to whip out my painter's tape if, if any of you guys saw me yesterday you know I I use a lot of painter tape um to mask off like, like when you're doing a painting, if, if any of you guys, have, uh, in fact, I got a Batman piece thing they've been working on this weekend. That's a fully painted piece. Uh, and I'm, I mask off the edges. So I'm, I'm doing the top edge right now. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it up a bit so you can see. Maybe I'll angle it up a bit so you can see a bit more of everything. How's that? All right. And what I do is I, I pull off the strip of the tape and I put it against the clothing I'm wearing just to pull a little bit of the, the extreme tackiness that can occur in painter's tape. It's not as bad as like straight up paper's tape, paper tape or uh, any other tape, but I don't really like um, the surface of the paper being removed by the tape when I, when I take the tape off at the end of a, a project. And by just literally touching the sticky side of the tape against your t-shirt, jeans, whatever you, um, you take some of that stick off and uh, it makes it less likely to damage the surface of the paper when you remove it. That's the sound, if you can hear that, if you can hear that, that's the sound of the tape going on my, uh, Actually, I'm wearing sweatpants in the studio today. So one of the benefits of like doing this convention event at home is I'm dressed like an absolute slob. I don't I don't think I put anything in my hair after my shower this morning. So my hair is probably doing its Don King impression. Um, it's a good thing I don't have a second camera set up yet. God. That's going to be a that's going to be a vanity test. I'm going to look up. I'm going to see myself while I'm drawing something. Oh God, I look stupid. And everyone else will just realize I I now know what they know. Um, all right. So when I'm doing special effects like this, I, I'll be using a combination of I have some like really beat up old um, flats, usually synthetic. Um, they're I, I can actually use them for regular painting. I mean, they're not so bad that they're unusable but since i so off oh yeah here we go beat up old flats you can see you can see like all the paint's gone uh this one's stained from like years of use and what i'll do is i'll i'll dip them in ink and I'll, I'll i'll get most of the paint off so i can do dry brush effects or i can like scrunch them so i end up getting like weird little clumps of bristles inside the overall shape of of the brush so i'll be using that I'm very much in love with my stupid fat Sharpie. Um, I love this pen uh, brush. Is it a pen? It's a marker. And if, if, you, if you drag it loosely across the surface, you get very dry brushy effects. And you can like, I mean, it's, it's, it's a weird shaped brush, but it's a brush in a, in a very core way. I mean, I can get solid blacks. But I also get those like really just just by lightly dragging the surface because it's a rather fibrous 
uh, marker to get that pigment going all the way through, I can get these like really rough dry brush effects. Into that, I'll use, um, uh, there's going to be some toothbrush effects at the end of it. Here's a beat up old one where I used a black uh, splatter. A lot of times I'll splatter black and I'll uh, just to add some more texture and depth to an area. And I'll, I'll do all my white splatter and special effects at the end. Um, and just weirdly enough, somehow white splatter over black splatter has a completely different effect that you would think that black splatter could theoretically achieve on its own. It just, it just does something neat. So I'll be doing that. Um, uh, brush markers, if I want like variable line weights and also some raw, this one's a little more dried out. I can also get like just really dirty lines is the way I look at it. Like not clean, like a, um, a nice liquid ballpoint gives me clean, sharp lines. I want dirty lines when I'm doing environmental effects like this. I want lines that are um, gross. Like if you did a drawing with it, you just kind of look at it and go, oh my God, what, 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 what is that? Oh, here. And you end up with a collection of really, really weird, odd pens over the years. Like I, I buy all sorts of stuff. Oh yeah, I remember. Okay, so I haven't used this Pigma uh, brush pen for ages. And it had a really great dry brush for that. And a whole bunch of memories coming back to me. And it, it was really good. Then it dried out completely. And I refilled it with fountain pen ink. Um, I'm trying to remember how I did. I think I, I, I essentially let it sit in fountain pen ink overnight. And then it just, the sponge through capillary action re-soaked. So I have this kind of like really nice, nice dark gray that comes out of it again. But it was a really good tool for like doing special effects. Ah, I lost a good tool for doing special effects. But this is this is generally how I proceed. I, I, I you develop a collection of pens and markers and stuff that make certain marks that may not be good or effective for your regular use, but they become um, uh, role players in, uh, in how you proceed to make work going forward. And those are those are really valuable. I mean, it's. Uh, I think it was um, talking to Joe Kubert. I was literally just starting to work in the industry, and I talked to Joe Kubert. And he asked what tools I used. And, I mean, I said, well, I was primarily a penciler. And uh, so I, I just used a pencil. And he says, well, when you're doing an ink drawing at a convention, I, uh, at that point, I was doing everything in pencil. I was terrified of ink. And um, he said, well, here's the secret. Anything you can use to make a mark is a good tool for drawing. So once you get over the fact that there is really, really is no difference between a pen and a pencil, uh, you'll feel a lot more comfortable with a pen. And, um, and I mean, it, it was true. You went on a little bit, talk, we, we ended up talking about sharp sticks because uh, that's where drawing came from, you know. And, um, and, and the fact is, yeah, it, I should be able to do a comic page with a sharp stick. And uh, my friend, Mike Ruth, if you don't know him, look him up. He's, he's an incredibly talented Canadian artist. Um, he will actually do whole commissions with like twigs or seeds or um, uh, I don't know, bones he finds in the wild. He'll do a whole drawing with some organic piece of um, detritus from the, that he found on a walk. And it's really amazing. I'm I'm not quite as brave as Mike. I mean, if forced to, I would draw with a weird piece of trash. Um, but I'm much more comfortable um, using tools that I've used before, and I know what kind of marks they're going to give me. Trying to start a draw, like literally, someone goes, "Here's a sharp stick, Richard. Do a drawing with it." I mean, I'd spend the first twenty minutes trying to figure out what kind of lines I can make with that sharp stick. All right, so. Um, this is a bottle cap from like, um, just a pop bottle and with it, and you can see I was using gloss ink last time. You can see it's shine, I think in there. Uh, what I do is I take an eyedropper of ink because I've had accidents, haven't you? Like ink going everywhere with an open ink bottle. So I have just maybe quarter teaspoon of, of ink in here. So it means I'll be refilling it a lot the more work I do. But then I take one of the brushes, 
I'm going to take the long, the longer bristles to start with. And just dip the tip in that ink. Can you see? Here we go. Yeah. And you see it has like a lot of flow right off the bat too much. But as just, there we go. And then now I got, let's turn this up so you can see what I'm doing at the top here. All right. So just to start it off, I'm, I'm flicking the brush along the idea where I want the smoke and clouds to go. And I'm working in the same direction, letting the, this, this paper has a little bit of tooth. It's the uh, Eon Artboard's uh, Vellum Bristol, which is my favorite surface. Um, I mean, Eon makes great artboards. Um, consider this a plug. And um, they're my favorite artboards. I, I, I hate to say it, though. It's not as toothy as Strathmore Vellum 500. It and which is not as good as it used to be. I, th I talked about this a little bit yesterday. Whereas uh, Strathmore used to be the the best paper um, for drawing comics, period. Um, but somehow over the last few decades, um, it's just not there. They're they're second rate compared to what they were able to produce in the eighties and nineties. And I think any artist who was working in that period will tell you that. I mean. We now have a generation of artists who who never use paper, um, which is fine. Um, but those of us who love traditional media surfaces, we feel a little betrayed. Um, uh, they've cheaped out in in a very significant way, and um, it it hurts hurts the work. It, it limits what we can do. Uh, I'm at the point where I don't trust uh, media surfaces to the point where I will do all my preliminary drawing on a separate sheet of paper. And, and this is entirely because I, I have no idea when I start a piece, how much drawing and erasing and redrawing I'm going to have to do on any specific piece of work. And the more drawing and redrawing I do on a piece of, say, artboard, the more I'm diminishing the quality and strength and durability of the surface. It, it's where drawing and erasing and redrawing and erasing is, is where on the surface. And what that does, is it affects how the ink can hit that surface later. Uh, if I have a real problematic piece or a page and um, I do all this work and then I'm finally happy with it, and then I start inking and somehow I damaged some of the surface. And the important thing to get across is the surface treatment, the sizing, the special treatment they put on, on the, uh, the top of the bristle board. That's, that was incredibly important to your ability to work on it. The, the ability of your, of your illustration board, your bristle board to take ink and have ink do what it needs to do on the surface of the board consistently is reduced the less consistent the sizing on the surface of the artboard is. And with Strathmore's surface being so inconsistent, um, I can't trust it. I, ju I just can't. And so what I do is I do the bulk of my drawing. And if, if anyone was watching yesterday, you saw me drawing on uh, Boris marker layout paper, which is also harder to get uh, up here in Canada. Um, and then I scan it, and uh, and they're not finished drawings. You, you've seen some of the drawings. Let's see if I can find the shredder drawing from yesterday. Threw it around somewhere. Probably my recycled bin. Hmm. Oh, it's in the bottom of my recycled. Do, do I really want to be digging through my recycle bin like right now? Okay, well, here's here's the Mobius piece from yesterday, sitting at the top. So you can see that level of drawing, and that's not tight. That's essentially a sketch. There's a little bit of frisket sitting there. Um, I would ink that, right? So that would get printed up blue on the board. So, and this is, I think, the third or fourth drawing I did in working up towards uh, the drawing I ended up inking. Um, it's it's really important to preserve the quality of the surface for the inking because the inking is what gets reproduced. Um, there used to be a joke about who was more important, the pencilers or the inkers. And 
And Inker's response to the supposed preeminence of pencilers was that, yeah, uh, at the end of the day, what gets reproduced are my ink lines. Uh, all your stuff ends up in, in the eraser pile at the, at the bottom of my desk, um, which is true <laughs> in a very significant way. Um, so all my penciling is it's it's unimportant um, once I'm getting this ink here. So because what ha get happens here is the actual final piece of work. Yeah, I'm gonna scumble in some more texture here using the using the brush. Now that if you can see that the brush has got some ink in it, it's getting a little clumpy because it's starting to dry, which means I have to really really clean it. I let it soak for a while and then give it a good cleaning at the end of the workday. Um, but it means it can give me these chunky uh, textural elements that I can like just stamp in. It's a little like Bob Ross, you know, but it, it, it changes the, the identity of an area by having stuff in it. It's like now it's chunky bits floating around in this smoke, not just me finding little bits of the tooth of the paper on the surface. It's it's me adding other visual elements. I could even like rubber stamp into this. I have my gradated rubber stamp and those dots, which would get lost in all this um, dry brush and stampy tone, but it would still create a more complex aspect to the whole visual image. I call it I call it visual noise, because um, ultimately that's what it's 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 I'm, you're creating noise, because um, no one's going to very specifically look at this area and go, how did he draw that? It it becomes uh, a, a, as much a tonal pattern as a signal of visual information that doesn't have to be looked at too intensely. Yeah, so this is this is how I think about my work. Visual noise, man. Visual noise. And I gotta tell you, the thing I like more about traditional media than digital media is there's a certain unpredictable unpredictability um, to this. I don't know exactly what shapes this brush will make when it hits that clumpy phase. And um, I start stamping it. I might get way too much pigment down. And that's not a good thing. But I may also get um, just a brilliant pattern of, of, of darks showing up that I wasn't planning on. I was like, this is already darker than I thought it was going to be. So I'll probably have to, like, right here, that's an accident. I didn't want it to be that dark right in this little area up here. Okay. So already I know I'm going to have to do some white paint stuff in there. And I'm, I'm being a little sloppy around the scarves floating here, um, knowing full well I'm going to have to pull highlights out of that to make it pop forward. But because I painted across it, it looks like a natural flow going through. So I can, I can do stuff like that. So sometimes you make mistakes on purpose, like brushing across the scarf like it did there. Sometimes you get a dark chunk of, ugh, and you kind of go, oh, I got to fix that. And the more you do it, the more you get resigned to, okay, there's certain mistakes you 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 plan for. You know they're going to happen, so you know how to immediately fix them. They're like, um, gosh, what would it be? What would be a good parallel to making a mistake that you can know you you know you can fix easily, but it's worth the risk? Hmm, anyone got anyone got an idea for that? Nope. Oh, hey, hi, Sills. Um, my laptop isn't set up quite high enough for me to constantly look at it while I'm uh, I'm drawing, so I have to kind of look over for it. So if if you post a question, give give me a little bit of patience uh, uh, to to end up seeing it. Um, says I, I do want people to comment. I do want people to say hi and all that stuff. All those wonderful you know social things. Um, but I am also here to draw for your entertainment.
one of the tricks to take care of um, these brushes, like this one's lasted me. I think I've had this brush for 10 years, 12 years, and I've been treating it terrible, terribly uh, in my work, doing stuff like this almost constantly with it because it's a synthetic brush. It can, it can take more punishment. Um, but I, I don't want to meet, like, I don't want to use a brush and then have to throw it away immediately. Um, so what I do is because it's synthetic and it can take the, take the, the, the burden of the damage I do to it. Um, I soak it in water immediately. Like as soon as I'm done with this, it's going to go in a jar of water. I got right beside my drawing table and, um, and it's going to soak there until I'm done streaming. So the water will do a tremendous amount of the work to uh, soften any of the pigment that's still sitting in there, make it easier to remove. And then I'll wash it with, uh, there's Artist Pink Soap. Uh, you may have seen it if you've gone to an art supply store. I don't know if it's any better, but it's like, I've, I've been buying it since art school. <laughs> so it's the stuff I use to clean brushes, just on the, on the faith that it actually does what it, it says it's supposed to do. Um, and, uh, I mean, I want to get some brush in there. Sorry. I just want to focus on that while I'm doing that. And painting across some areas that are, are otherwise going to be highlighted. Um, I don't mind actually, you know what? I actually don't mind going right across that back leg. It has dual effect of pushing this back visually. But when I go back in with white paint on top of that, it's going to make those highlights look a little bit better. Um, I was talking about something and I interrupted myself and now I can't remember what I was talking about. Hey, that's quality streaming right there. It's almost good. Now I want to balance out. Let's see, I got this dark bit of cloud here. I know I'm going to go in and lighten that later with, you know, either straight up white paint, splatter, uh, Pentel correction pen. But I want a little bit more dark. Let's see here. I'm gonna... Yeah, I think I want a little bit more dark to come into that. So. And I used up all the ink, have to top it up again. Again, that's about a quarter teaspoon of ink. Um, doing it this way means I do not have the, the risk of knocking over a whole bottle of open ink, which I have done. Uh, any artist length, any length of time has probably done that uh, a few times in their career. Um, I think probably the only artist who could do it and recover from it fully would probably be Bill Sienkiewicz. Um, you'd probably see uh, an ink accident of that scope as a brilliant opportunity to do something new. Uh, Bill's just the best. So you can see where it's like, this is a very random looking pattern that just, just emerged from my stamping. Stamping the brush. Maybe I can actually recover that by actually darkening the whole area so it won't stick out as much. Um, let's brush in there a bit. I think I'm mostly done up here. And focus down here a bit. So you can see what I'm going to do down here. There we go. Now, one of the things that you learn about as you're, as you're working with values and everything is that um, when you have a whole bunch of gray values, highlights pop 
and absolute black dark areas like areas of super high contrast also pop. So I am going to be creating areas that I can work with right here at the foreground of the piece that are just darker. And you can see I'm using this really ugly line um, uh, by drawing with the brush. And it gives me these wonderful organic forms to play around with. And I'm, I'm actually kind of using them directionally because, I mean, the shredder figure has this triangular composition built into it. And I'm going to use the landscape, not to cartoonishly point everything up towards, you know, shredder's head, but I'm going to be using uh, the directional aspects that I'm introducing here on the ground plane to be going up towards shredder. I wonder if I should play some music. If it, the, the silence is, I know dead air is a terrible, terrible thing. Um, but I also know playing music on YouTube can get part of your stream completely turned into dead air. Um, but I wonder if I pulled up like some public domain music or, or that and just had that lightly playing in the background to make the silence seem less, oh, I don't know, silent. Um, what do you guys think? Break this up here a bit more. It's a little too white. So I want this, this lava in the background here to pop a bit more when I get to it. Yeah. Soften that. So I think I got to start with this. I'm going to do some, take the last of that ink and then just introduce kind of like uh, more solid forms here in the ground level. Make these darks a little darker. Trying to make it like he's, I don't know, uh, growing up Catholic, the idea of hell as being this eternally fiery place was like in the media already. Um, I don't, I don't think even necessarily think it's Catholic. I, I'm pretty sure almost every culture, uh, sorry, every, every, every religious group going to North America has a very specific idea of hell generated by, um, the media like the idea that hell is a is a hot burning inferno of 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 lava and sulfur um is just there that's that's the popular perception of it um and therefore everyone sees hell as that yeah eternal punishment but i mean the actual the fact that i got this like flaming landscape here um eternal punishment could be like i mean i'm from canada eternal punishment could just be endless cold um eternal punishment could just be a lack of any environmental feeling um i mean there's there's as as an adult divorced from any sort of like dogmatic religious um treatment hell is a uh a very amorphous idea i mean what hell i mean I, i've seen writers talk about hell and say well hell's other people well yeah, okay um 
here I am. I'm, I'm actually using uh, a little Unipin brush pen because I want I want somewhat organic shapes to to complement the uh, the lava shapes, the uh, crackle lava shapes I've been introducing here. Um, yeah, so hell can be any of a number of things. Any, basically, anything that makes people miserable can be a hell. Um, but the popular cultural idea that hell is a place of eternal fire, like the lake of fire aspect, I think comes from Judeo-Christian, more, more honestly, Christian. I don't think, I don't, as far as I remember, I don't think Jews specifically have any concept of eternal punishment. That, that's, that's, you know, that was the hammer that the church came up with to, uh, make people say, well, you know, you have to do what we say, or, you know, I know your life's miserable now as a surf in the middle ages, uh, but it can get worse. Um, and therefore, you know, that's where you get hell. Um, I mean, the ludicrous idea of, of hell spitting out of Christianity, I'm probably upsetting some people here, but if Jesus is all about forgiveness and love and, you know, giving people chances to atone and, and get forgiveness, the idea of hell is contradictory in the extreme. Um, yes, that's that's why I woke, this is what I woke up thinking I'd talk about on stream. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so hell hell is a is a ha is a political hammer. It's 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 the tool devised to make people think they have to do. What the church tells them is the right thing and not, not any specific church but any any religious group that says if you don't do what i say you're going to go to hell um well if if you're already believing in any sort of like divine uh power uh no the the, the divine power that's going to send you to hell for reasons as yet undetermined uh isn't the guy in the front of the room telling you do what i say Okay, he's you. You can't trust any human to that level. I mean, because uh, none of them have died, gone to hell, checked it out, said, "Ooh, this is a crappy place," and then come back to tell everyone. They're just as mortal and as bound by the mortal coil as anyone else. So, yeah, fuck that guy. All right, so. I think as you can see, like uh, the weird kind of like level of uh, the lava I got going on here. In a bit, I'm going to start using my fingers on uh, this correction pen fluid. Uh, cause you can get these amazing like smear effects. look at the good thing about having access to look at the laptop hey good morning jc dragon um yeah the wonderful thing about the laptop is i especially when the piece is taped to the drawing table uh i can look at the monitor now and go oh wow okay that's how it's looking makes me happy technology advancements making me happy i like i, I gotta I gotta roar love when that happens all right you can also point out the highlights
because I used um, an actual ink, uh, it makes, as opposed to like a brush pen or something, it makes uh, my white pigment markers. I'm trying to decide which one I should dig out. I, I hate opening up a new one when I already got like three or four well in use. I try and use them up as I open them. I have an open white pen in here. Oh, I actually, I wonder if one of these gel pens will work on this. There we go. So I can actually, you know, do very faint. Wow, this one's like flowing transparently, not with any opacity. Hmm, get rid of that. This one. Also not, not a good one. You don't know, think that these aren't good pens to use. I am I am very disappointed with um it seems that I'm the one who gets to use those um white paint gel pens to the least positive effect. Uh, I feel sad for myself. All right, so this is a straight up acrylic. Here we go. This is, I picked it up off of Amazon, Flymax paint marker. Uh, it was incredibly cheap for a box of, I think, six. Um, hell of a bargain. And I keep forgetting I have them because I'm so used to using the Poscas. But um, they give a nice, nice opaque line when you're drawing on top of ink or acrylic, um, which is really, really handy. Actually, you know what? This is a good time. Those rivets. I want to get the underlight hitting the, those rivets on his chest. Is that on the camera? No, it's not. There we go. So I plotted out these rivets that I saw in the samurai armor I dug up yesterday. And I just want to give little subtle highlights to indicate they're catching light from below. It's not a big thing, but it's a good thing. Break this out a bit. Sometimes uh, paint markers are just tricky to get flowing properly. And you gotta jab them a bit, get that ink coming out.
set. Can you see that? I'm doing the, there's this weird kind of like tapping motion where you push the nib of the uh, pen all the way into the uh, paint marker to get some extra flow. So this one might be running low. I've been using this one for a little while. I think the trick, I got asked about this, there's there's no real like technique as much as look at what's going on in real life around lava flows and everything. If you want to draw like a lava flow, look at it, draw it a few times, and then, you know, try and remember what you did. <laughs> and that way you'll be able to like, you know, simulate the effect of like these lava flow type of things. Draw them in the future. more pencil correction pen i'm working at the bottom again so let me reset the angle here i guess i could like pull the camera further up so you can see the uh the hole of the piece i'm working on at any given point but there's also a part of me that kind of like i think you want to get like kind of close into what i'm drawing so you can see it and i think if i pulled up the camera so you could see the whole piece all the time, you really wouldn't get any sense of the detail that's going on. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe all of you want to see the whole piece all the time, not any details. I'm just going on by what I like to see. Now, there was a mistake when I drew this blade yesterday, and I'm just gonna white out part I don't like. I'm also gonna get that highlight in on the bottom edge of the blade.
some of the stuff that I'm waiting at, I actually have to go back in and do a little bit of reestablish a black line after I waited out too much just to get the uh, the edge happening again. That's just part of the course for uh, for getting the stuff to work. I think I'm going to be using any black paint for the rest of this piece. I can put the, that little piece aside. Um, let me get in here. I'm working up top here again. So let me get in here in the scarf so I can get those highlights on the underside of it again. as I bang my head off the camera. But... So camera, yeah, you know, barely. All right, so I lost a little bit of line work getting these special effects in. So I just go back in to point one. Sorry, zero one. Just get what goes on top of the Pentel correction pen really well. Allows me to reestablish those lines.
get those things popping that need to be popping. Popping. And this is the really stupid fun part is when I dig up the white paint. I don't know where's my white paint jar. There it is. All right. So I do this so bloody often. I actually have it's one of those old Batman, um, Jim Carrey, Tommy Lee Jones, George Clooney. Was that the Batman for that movie? I can't remember. They're so terrible. Um, it's perfect size. I have like dried up white paint in it. That's where I actually keep my white paint paintbrush. And what I do is I just take a squeeze bottle of water that I have standing in my studio. I soak the brush. You see that? I soak the brush with some water. Sometimes I have to add more um, white paint. I'm using uh, gouache that's rewettable. Acrylic would be kind of like pointless to do this with. Um, so there's dried white paint inside the brush already. Um, all sorts of dried white paint lining this, this cup. And I'm just reactivating it. And I can make it as goopy, like really thick, so it's like clumpy, uh, blobby spatter. Or it's uh, super fine. And to do that, I just use um, less, sorry, more water to get more of a fine Batter effect. So I use, I reactivate as much of the paint from the side of the jar and the bottom as I can with the toothbrush. Uh, this is a case where I don't know if you can see it, you can kind of see through the bottom. It means I've used up a lot of the white paint that was already in there. So I go to my jar of Turner Design Gouache. And this is where I pull my white paint from. Since this is pretty much all I use this for, I don't mind like sticking, literally sticking the brush and pulling out some paint with it. I'm sure there's like artists out there who are like going, <gasps> God, it's so, it's so not how it's done. Because you usually try and keep your paint as clean as possible. But since the only thing I ever use this for, except for when I'm actually painting, but then I use an um, uh, actual tube of uh, white gouache uh, where I could squeeze over what I need. So this this ends up being the perfect thing for spatter. And because I can plan to keep working in the studio today, let's see if I got something here that I do. I um uh, the last thing I want is have to like be continually scrubbing my hands all day while I'm working on stuff. So I have a some on sale at my local shoppers drug mart, a big box of like large latex gloves. I originally started using these during the pandemic because you know everyone needed latex gloves because we didn't know how it spread at the start. Uh, and then I got used to using them in my studio, especially like when I'm doing things like cleaning my airbrush. Um, I think there's slight more durable ones but i mean i got these for like almost like 10 cents a glove i think that's a remarkable good price up here in canada but i think i think the black ones are slightly more durable because every once in a while uh i burst right through especially when I'm using black ink i burst right through actually i was going to do black ink first was was not i don't think i need it for this one i just want to get a nice spatter effect going up from these little volcanoes here too much paint loaded up here. There we go. This is more of that visual noise I was talking about earlier. Now, if anything was so precious, that it needed to be masked off. I, of course, would would either use frisket or you know painter's tape or any of another number of objects to uh, 
mask off areas. I didn't want any white paint going, but there's nothing in this piece that I can't go back in and draw in some more details. And I can be pretty directive with the toothbrush. I can actually control where most of it goes. And I want a little bit of that, that spatter to go everywhere anyway. I mean, it's like if hell's like this big, you know, sulfurous churning nightmare of fire, um, you're not going to be able to uh, have a pristine look at anything. I mean, unless there's like, you know, like a climate controlled office in hell, you know, that the senior demons get to uh, occupy. Then you'll have, you know, air conditioning and stuff like that. I kid. Pretty sure they're a lot more environmentally cautious in hell and they'll use air conditioning. Plus, I think it's a dry heat. Yeah, I think they're from McDonald's. I, I'm pretty sure it's like one of my former students was trying to collect them and I actually had a spare of the one she was trying to collect. I mean, this is this is the kind of like yeah, I saw the movie. I don't have any nostalgia for it. Um, they just like these handy sized glass mugs. And they're perfect for like doing something like this in the studio. And I guess there's a comic connection to it. Um, um, but uh, yeah, this is uh, I'm more than happy to. Uh, I think I, I think I actually have. The other two I still have in my bathroom is toothbrush uh, cups. So I'm sure there's someone who is going to immediately ask me to wash them out and sell them for like some stupid amount of money. I might say yes because I don't care. But it, they just they were just handy small cups um, for what I wanted to do. That's that's it, man. That's all it is. And we're really getting close to being done on this one. I mean, we're, what, an hour in. Yeah, I wouldn't have been able to finish this last night, especially with the weird pulsing that was distracting me with the camera from, and a friend of mine tells me it was very likely from overheating from running so long. Uh, and I, I got to tell you, I, I'm very new to this. This is now the very second live stream I've ever done. Um, so I'm learning like mad because <laughs> the, the curve is real. Um Oh, I got a big blob of paint. I think I might have to dab off there. Um, oh, let's, let's get some across there. Um, yeah, I think this would have been too much to do last night. I was also kind of fried. All the nonstop talking that I'm doing by doing the solo is a little exhausting. Uh, Get back from this here. I think I want a little bit more heavy splatter here. All right, I have to let this dry now. Um, I'm going to dab up some of the excess white that kind of collected. Like if you could see right here, there's a big blob that just either a big blob of paint came off right from the brush and I didn't catch it, or um, uh, a bunch of the bob, blobs coalesced. So what I got to do is very carefully yeah, some of that dab there 
and actually with the paper towel because it's such a coarse surface i can actually use some of that pigment to add, add a little bit of noise to some very small detail areas use it to get rid of some of that blue that's still showing up And before I scan this, I am going to have to hit it with some workable fixative to make sure that uh, the gouache stays down. And uh, that's just for the good. That that protects the piece. It protects the. Uh, I'm gonna go back in and draw a little bit around this helmet here. But yeah, this is this is pretty much done. Oh, <laughs> okay. So these bugs are, are are worthless, which is probably I think McDonald's gave away millions upon millions of these. Um. So I uh, I'm not I'm not heartbroken at all that uh, I might be risking losing my uh, my favorite uh, bathroom mugs. I think let's, let's sharpen this a bit. Uh... All right, I should probably sign this thing too, shouldn't I? Um can sign a white paint here, probably. I know what I gotta do. Let's give you a large impact. There it is. Just created a dark spot to sign with white paint. Still wet in spots. Um, this is definitely wet. I am going to mute while I use my handy dandy hair dryer to dry this a little forcibly. So let me just mute. Oh my God, it's pulsing already. Well, this is uh, really worrisome. So at the end of the day yesterday, if you could see the visual pulsing that's happening on the camera, that happened near the end of the day. And um, it's happening already. Like we're just, 
an hour and 10 minutes into it and it's starting to do this, I might have, I might actually have a defective camera. Um, I'm really, really worried about this. Uh, if anyone, anyone knows what to do about that, um, I think it might be at risk of overheating. So I'm going to go get a cooling pack and see if like just physically cooling the camera will do something while it's streaming. Otherwise, I shit, I don't know what I'll do. I don't know where I can. Oh, it stopped. I think the threat of hitting it with a cooling pack made it stop. Um, all right. Okay. Fingers crossed. It doesn't start up again. So here I am pulling off the tape. So you can see the uh, the nice handling edge is largely left untouched here, or largely completely left untouched because it was covered by tape. Um, one downside is is that white paint will um, slide off the tape as I peel it up. So right off the bat, I got to uh, brush down the, the drawing tape. I'm sure I don't end up with like all sorts of like powdered white paint. On my, on my hand and then suddenly in my artwork. Oh, it's flickering, man. Do you guys, you, uh, my God. No idea why it's starting, no why, idea why it's, oh. Okay, so I have autofocus off and maybe that's the issue. Maybe having autofocus off is causing it to have a hard time stay focused where here on the surface. So maybe when like things are moving, maybe that overwhelms the camera. See what happens now. Oh, let's put this up here. Make a focus on that. Yeah, uh, that was uh, here it goes again. Oh no, found its focus again. All right. Yeah, it might be uh, overheating uh, for being on for too long. But again, it's only been on for an hour and 15 minutes. And it seems to have lost focus again. Hmm. Well, that's not too bad. Um, I'm not taking a break for another 45 minutes. So I'm gonna start sketching. Uh, I got a Batman painting I wanna work on. I don't wanna like dive into that and then have to shut down the stream because the camera explodes or something. Um, so I'm just going to check to see what's next on the list to do. Wait at my desktop because I don't want to do it on the laptop here because I want to be able to keep looking here. Um, uh, it looks like a Hellboy. I'm waiting for confirmation. Well, I'm always up for drawing a Hellboy. So even if they haven't confirmed yet, I think I might just draw a Hellboy next. People seem to like me drawing Hellboy. Um, yeah, let's do that and uh, take a look at and uh, let's mute this. Yeah, yeah that's pretty good detail. All right, let me um grab pad paper. Oh, when I take my break, I'll uh, I'll scan this and then post it. A uh, friend of mine told me that I should start using OBS for a number of reasons, but one of which is I could actually turn off the camera um, and have a title card showing while I'm on my breaks and allows the camera to cool down. Um, but I think before I start drawing Hellboy, I'm going to uh, put a cooling pack, small cooling pack on the camera to keep it. Oh, it's actually hot in one spot. Yeah, that's worrisome. I'll be right back.
So I have a uh, cooling gel pack on my camera right now. Um, so hopefully, you know, hopefully that won't be an issue. Um, fiddle with it, you got to more against the surface of the camera. So where's my drawing area? My drawing area is from here to there. All right. All right. Um, oh boy. Sorry, I'm now distracted. I feel I have to keep looking at the camera to see if it's going to be blurry. Um, okay, so I've drawn Hellboy a lot of times. Um, so I kind of know, um, I don't want to draw his head, but I want to, I'm usually like, am I doing a big piece or am I doing a small piece? I don't want to keep, you know, repeating myself in this, but, uh, there's an aspect of Hellboy I just I just I just love drawing. Look at left to right. Look at left to right. So this is a nine by twelve, so I can. Get my shape of Hellboy down. This is almost like the comfort food level of drawing. I, I'm, I've drawn Hellboy so many times. A lot of people, I'm really, really grateful for the amount of people who actually like the way I draw Hellboy. That that feels really good because you know, it's one of my favorite characters uh, to draw. Um, So, yeah, drawing Hellboy just feels comfortable. I mean, it's like, yeah, I draw a lot of nudes. I like I like drawing naked women. Um, that's that's very comfortable for me too, because um, it's just a, very much an exploration of anatomy at that point. Um, and that goes into just you know um, thinking that the shapes are incredible to play around with. Um, study and, and get better at drawing. But something with Hellboy, those that weird, the weird proportions of the head, um, that 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 Kirby esque brow here that you know Kirby gave so many so many characters. Um, those those incredible razor sharp cheekbones. Those freaking horns are sometimes some there are some days when I, I try and draw Hellboy and I just can't get those horns in place on his head right. Um and I, I've looked at Mike's work and a lot of times it doesn't matter how he places his horns in his work. I mean it's it's just um it's it's almost like he doesn't really care. He just kind of draws them and they, they work because that's you know it's it's Mike, he's drawing his character. It'd be kind of cool to do like a light coming from here and then a light coming from here. So this would be shadow. There'd be core shadow here. The horn would be largely silhouette. Like this horn would be largely silhouetted. This horn would also be silhouetted. And I think it would shadow would come down to there. So it'd be that. Um, his kind of fucked up hairline. His ear out, Not really tiny ears because he has a really tiny nose. Ponytail. I gotta tell you, giving him, making Hellboy bald with the ponytail, possibly one of the most brilliant character design moments in the last forty years. I mean, that just made him immediately so 
identifiable to so many people in this population. I think I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get the shoulders there. And then the BPRD symbol, which I always have to look at. I've drawn the BPRD symbol, like nowhere near as much as anyone who's drawn the book. But I've drawn it dozens of times. And from memory, it's like, I understand, it's like the circle, the center point of the sword going through the, to the pommel, is also like where the fingers go and uh, the hand and the pommel does that, I believe, and the sword does that. That's the way I remember it. But I always, I'm always ultimately surprised when I pull up the BPRD logo and try and draw it correctly. There's, I always get some of this wrong. I, I can't remember what it is. I have to see it. I, I, I just think that this is the center line. Maybe the balls go over here. Maybe, maybe. There is no indent there in the bottom hand. There's something with the fingers I always get wrong. I think they're more of a swoop like that. When I first saw it, and I wasn't paying attention to it, I thought it looked a lot like the cat in the hat, like a cartoonish version of the cat in the hat, right? So, yeah. So um, I think I'm going to, I'll do that. I'll let it fall away and then I'll just draw the BPRD symbol and there will be that this Hellboy. Let me get these horns so uh, sorted. So I don't know if that's the right placement. Maybe that comes down a bit more. There's also a tendency where I want to put them closer to the eyes, but I know that's wrong. I know it's set higher in the head than uh, I'm normally inclined to draw them. Also, do I want to give him smoke? Nah, done too many times already. Soul patch. Uh, I kind of think I want the eye more up onto that brow. Got some of that nose. Sharpen up this part here a bit. Yeah, I don't know if I got the eye placement right until I actually get it sitting in a shadow there. So it'd be a cheekbone shadow there, cheekbone shadow there. Rim light there. Real bone concavity there, jaw coming up here. So there'd be a rim light coming through there on the lip. Cut that out a bit, get the eraser.
Englewood might hit the underside of his nose a bit in terms of lighting from that side. That wouldn't get hit by anything. Um, boom, boom. Thanks so much, JC. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the, uh, the shredder. Um, putting it aside like it just did means I can actually, uh, you know, reconsider if I need to do any work before I hit it with the workable fixative and scan it later. Um, kind of like residual hair that Mike gave Hellboy back in the day. I have to go too far forward, uh, too far back across the chin. I think this would be kind of like a half shadow thing. It would get like light glaze grazing across its surface. Um, I think this would be facing away, so it'd be a little more of a curve going that way. Let's bring the, the head looks a little narrow at the top. Let's bring that back a bit. Boom, boom. Back on in. I think maybe there'd be a little bit of light at the idea that that cheekbone is so advanced. Go dark with it, let some of it hit there. Um, that happened there. Get some like nicks and scratches, dents. Hellboy's face here. Yeah, I think that works. This will be there. Let me see if I can quickly pull up a BPRD logo. Excuse me. Sorry. Uh -huh. Size large. Uh. 
Oh, I know what I forgot. All right, here we go. Uh, do a tag. I always forget about it. There it is. That's what I forget. I always forget this thing here, that, that triangle. Um, yeah, it is the center line that comes down to the ball. It, there's no other balls there. Um, and the line is off, is, is there, but the, the ball is off center. All right, okay. Well, let me let me get this down here. Let me, do I have a good size circle to put it on hand so I don't have to actually freehand it? Probably do. Where did I put it? Hmm. Ah, it's a problem like just working on so many different things in the studio at any given moment. A piece of uh, kit might end up in the wrong part of the studio or in a traveling case because I worked remotely last week. Let's see if it's in that. Nope, another subscribe. Oh, where would that have ended up? It ended up in the pile of sketches. And if those pieces, no. Hmm. Curious and curious, sir. All right, looks like I'm gonna have to freehand it. Um, I do have a compass somewhere. Um, do I have, that's pretty big, the hole on the inside hole in that tape roll, it's pretty close to what I was going to draw. Okay, let me use the inside of that. There we go. Also use... use that, there we go. And I'm kind of, it's going to be an organic Hellboy patch, like the one that's stitched on. Um, so it's not going to matter. They're going to be freehanding so many elements. But getting a good circle to start with always helps. All right. So here we go. And you guys can't see what I'm drawing. Hang on. There you go. So I'm going to be trying to replicate. BPRD logo. Oh, you're right. And the line cuts through the thumb there too, doesn't it? So I, I drew it up. Can you just drew it up there from memory? And I obviously missed a triangle. I had some of the other elements there. So I really gotta. I should really have this down by now. I don't. It's an embarrassment. It's probably not that far up. All right. So we go there. So that's the hand there. I just drew this recently too uh, for the Hellboy piece I did on things that are getting sketchy. But nope, can I remember it? Never, never. Someday, someday I'll draw a Hellboy project. And for some reason, there won't be any. PRD logo in it because I mean he quit. Uh, then he died. Spoilers, uh, but he's still having adventures. Big index finger, slightly smaller middle finger, and smaller yet through these other fingers. Got this coming to there. Going back up to there. Yeah, I got to tell you, I swore that this looked like the cat in the hat when I first saw it in Hellboy Comics way back when. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. And you know what? I, 
I'm going to cheat and just grab one of my circle templates and get a good circle in there that is the size that I need. So I'm get too close to the. Uh, too big. Might be a scotch too big, but I don't know for sure until I draw it. It looks all right. And um, triangles pretty much sitting near the bottom. It's also off center. It's, it's like I always would have figured that center probably previously have drawn it so it's like the triangles on center, but it's off center as well. So it's, this line is coming down to the point of it. So maybe I drew that in the wrong spot. This probably is coming down there. So. There's condensation falling off the water pack. <laughs> I'm using to keep my camera cool. I'll probably take it off in a few minutes and then put it back in the freezer and then apply it again in a bit. Last thing I want is this melting onto a piece of artwork. <laughs> I'm working on, oh, water drops. I mean, if I'm painting, sure. I mean, I can deal with excess water in a painting. But um, not so much uh, pen and ink work. Yeah, okay, so I think I got the, the BPRD logo. Let me just, you know what? I think I'm going to do a cleanup drawing of this and plan out the shadow, scan it, print it on the, uh, the 9 by 12 and start drawing that. Um, yeah. So this is fucking huge for... Uh, for a nine by 12, so I'm gonna have to reduce it. And instead of redrawing it, I think I just wanna scan it and reduce it and print it in blue like I normally do. All right. So the eye looks kind of sad. That's a little bit better. Here we go. Just dripped again. Yeah, like a half tone. Get his hair coming down from there, hold it around to the bun, ponytail. Beer. I remember early on, uh, I was like telling someone that Hellboy's got pointy ears. Went, no, he doesn't. That would look stupid. And I'm like, did you not look at the comic you bought? Hellboy's got pointy ears. He's also got uh, hoof feet. I've seen people draw Hellboy um, without his hooved feet. His cloven feet, I should say. Uh, and it's clear that they just they just didn't know. They just drew with regular feet. Hellboy's got cloven hooved feet.
Tu. Pull that back a bit. Pull this back a bit. Bones and as big as uh, I, they are in my memory. They just look wrong when they're drawn too big. That's out too far as well. As it becomes clearer as I draw it, more of a line drawing of it. It's something about, if you've seen um, the movie with uh, Sling Blade, with Billy Bob Thornton, um, uh, a bunch of other actors, uh, um, he did something, Billy Bob did something with his jaw. He had, he had like this extreme underbite. And um, sometimes when I'm drawing Hellboy, I have to think about Billy Bob Thornton, uh, his character in Sling Blade, because it was like, mm -hmm. Some people call it a sling blade. Um, I just can imagine Hellboy saying that. Uh, not not from any sort of willingness to to say it, but it just it, that underbite he's got is just so that it's it's just that. Okay, so I got that. It's gonna come up, catch some light there a bit, I think, and then that. Okay, shadow's gonna come through there. Mm -hmm. How do the that seam's there in the front? I'm trying to remember when the seam on the shoulder is. Actually, I think it I think it goes like I think a shoulder seam seam is is that. Yeah, I think I think that's how it goes. I could look it up. Um I have you guys waiting for me to look up so many other things like samurais when I don't need to do samurai reference. Uh, but it's Hellboy. I feel embarrassed if I have to look up something when it's Hellboy. All right, let's uh, sketch out the uh, BPRD logo. And I think I'm going to take the cooling pack off because it's starting to really drip on the actual paper now. Um, so I can scan this and, you know, I can pull that thing out again and draw a circle again. Because it's faster to do it this way. There you go. Yeah. I'm already struggling with my memory of what this logo looks like. I just can't even see what I'm drawing down here. Let me just take this off the uh, camera. It's starting to drip with force. Drip with force. That that's got to be a name for something. Uh, although my camera is now super cool now, um, so I might do that again. Although I might wrap it in a paper towel initially to uh, keep it cool. And I'm going to uh, install OBS or not update OBS and then do what I need to do. Maybe I might even do that tonight after the stream's over. Um, see if I can do that, figure out that title card thing.
so I'm not exhausting my camera. Did I miss anything? No, that's pretty much all the uh, the core drawing I need to ink. So let me do that. Do Photoshop while import we use import start okay scan. It's processing the scan. Get some paper ready to print. And looks all right. I'm not seeing any massive issues. No, I want them to crop around there. Crop. Usually want it to be around nine inches tall. Let's make this height nine. All right, now I'll just cut off a half inch on the, the side here. All right. Get the size that I want. Curves. No. Don't want to put a border on this quite the way you normally would, but uh. Yeah, let's do that. Sense saturation, lightness. Okay. Put settings. Okay. Point eight seven five. All right. Oh, 
what what's happening here? Oh yes, it does match. Hang on. Let's get this so let's see where I'm Wow, I just knocked something off a shelf. All right, so this is not showing up on camera at all because I've had to suddenly grab something. There we go. All right, hell boy. Um, pull up my set square so I can. I had this idea for what I wanted to do for like uh, framing, just as I was about to print it. So let me just get these dots connected. Bring it up from here. That went straight. Hang on. That was a little off. All right. And I'm going to pull it across to this. All right. Cool. So I'm going to start with point one. One. It's the go to. And I need my glasses as I start to ink. If you want to get on, there's a few spots left. Uh, if you want to get on the commission list for this uh, this live stream, and there's all of three of you. Hey, hi, people. If you want to get on the commission list for this live stream, uh, you go to Cadence Comic Art uh, into the commissions area, and there's a drop down menu which will show you all the options available for what you can get me to do uh, live on stream this weekend. Uh, it includes if you actually go all out and the still hasn't been taken, so it's like the one real super available one. If you go for a cover uh, quality commission, uh, I have this one off foil Batman Killer Croc print I did, and I just think it's bonkers amazing. I don't know why I didn't do more of these prints, I just did this one, uh, and I never, you know, never tried to sell it. I just I did it, I liked it. Um, I don't think I would hang it in my studio. It'd be too visually distracting. Uh, but if someone really, really likes this, I will throw this in free with the very first cover quality commission uh, for this weekend's uh, live stream. Ooh. Maybe, maybe this destroyed my camera when I showed this yesterday. Is it focusing? It's why wow, it's still focusing. So maybe it was the heat. Maybe it was the heat. So uh might have to put that cool pack on the uh, the camera again. We'll highlight to that.
this is just the way I, I tend to build values. When I was a, an art student, um, one of the texts for a painting class was Hawthorne on painting. Uh, Hawthorne was a, um, uh, a master painter um, and he wrote this, this wonderful little booklet. It was maybe 90 pages um, about painting. And one of the principles that was really, really important, and it just stuck with me because it's an important principle to any sort of drawing or painting with any sort of value in it, is establish your lightest lights and your dark, darkest darks early on. And what that means for a black and white drawing, establish where your darkest point in the drawing is going to be. If it's going to be black, find out where black is in your drawing. And also pay attention to where the white is on your drawing, because all your other values, of course, are going to fall in between. But so many people will start and they won't, they, they don't want to commit to that darkest dark. So they end up with these drawings that have no, no range to them. And, and I'm not saying that you every drawing has to go from like white to black. There's lots of drawings that don't go beyond 30, 40, 50 percent gray. But you have to know where in the range of the values you're going to do in your piece, where that darkest element's going to be. If it's that 30, 40, 50% gray, you have to know that because everything else has to be lighter than that for you to control the range of your drawing or painting. So um, there's going to be a lot of white in here and there's going to be a lot of black in this piece. But knowing that that black is right there and that white are adjacent to each other, I know that to establish that any sort of light's hitting something, it's going to be a little bit lighter than that. Uh, anything turning towards shadow in the slightest from, say, a highlight across the head or anything has to be a little darker than that eye. And with cross hatching, because it's, it's, it's essentially binary, it's either black surface, white surface, um, I have to be careful about how I apply the hatching. I, I'm using a, a, a zero one auto graphic uh, liner pen. Um, if I want to have a finer gradation, I will jump over to, where is it? Here we go. A 005 lighter pen. So I can actually have a uh, finer hatching, which will allow me to get, um, a greater range of values. Uh, liquid. I don't want to ruin my throat. Last night I could barely talk. After it, it's like my son came over. He goes, "I know what you need." He he, he got us milkshakes, and I love my son. <laughs> my son brought me a milkshake after that stream. It was nine and a half hours of streaming yesterday. Um, I will not be going that long today. Um, I'll be going close to the end of the Chicago. I I also weirdly made a mistake. I woke up, went, "Oh my god, aren't I supposed to start early?" Because I'm just so used to being, I'd go to Chicago and I'd keep my watch on Toronto time, but my phone would automatically show me central time. So I automatically knew exactly what time it was in Toronto, what time it was in Chicago. And for some reason, my brain fired off backwards and I started streaming two hours yesterday, two hours earlier yesterday. Yeah, that's all on me. That that was, that was my mistake. Um, but. It was like, I was like, why am I so tired? I'm not, I don't get this tired at a con. And it was because it was like, I was already running two hours nonstop uh, than I normally do. I mean, there's also, I mean, the element of like, I'm doing all this talking just to, to avoid dead air. Um, and I'll, I'll probably do that again today. But, oh boy, this is, uh, it's a lot. It's a lot, kiddos. Um, I, I do a, a streaming event like this again, uh, of any length, let's say, I don't know, um, what would be a show that people would want another weekend where I'm streaming all weekend. If I do that, I definitely, uh, no more than one less other artist. I mean, there has to be at least two of us so we can chatter back and forth. Um, uh, preferably three or four so people can take longer breaks if they need it. Um, and more variety of people to, to come on, more people to be attracted to to uh, participate and view and, and all that stuff. That would that would be ideal. I'd love I'd love if 
every major convention I'm not going to, if I'm still available that weekend, I'd love to do a streaming event like this with other artists. Uh, I just think that would be uh, a fun and good thing to do. I mean, it's like, imagine doing Artist Alley, but you don't have to fly somewhere and move everything. Uh, I, I miss all the socialization, of course. I, I, that's my favorite part of, of cons. Of, uh, meeting other pros, meeting other fan, uh, meeting new fans, fans I've seen before. That that is the the best part of it. But uh, the travel itself, not so much. I, I don't I don't particularly. And the worst the worst part of travel, honestly, is Toronto Airport. It, I, I mean, I, I live in Toronto, so that means the first part and the last part of every trip I take is going to be garbage. Because Toronto Airport is one of the worst airports um, operating, I think, in North America right now that that operates out of a real major city. It's it's just a terrible airport. Um, it's badly planned. Um, there's areas where you have to walk for like 40 minutes. You get through customs and you have to walk for 40 minutes um, to get to where you need to be to wait for a flight. And there have been times where it's like I arrived in time for the flight. They say arrived three hours early. There's a longer line at customs. So suddenly you're in customs line for an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, then you check your baggage and then you get there and it's like, oh, God, I may not make it to the gate because the gate is at this far end of this airport that's so poorly designed and planned. It's. um yeah, I got to say, Toronto Airport is what makes me not want to do more cons. <laughs> uh, the American airports, for uh, uh, for the most part, even like the really, really busy ones, are generally better. Now, I haven't been to all the U.S. Uh, airports. That, that's absolutely true. I mean, I've heard, I've heard bad things about Atlanta. Uh, I've never been to Atlanta Airport. Uh, I've heard bad things about Chicago Airport, uh, but I've never... This is anecdotal, of course. I've never had a problem at O'Hare. Um, O'Hare's been O'Hare's been very good to me. I've made every flight out of Chicago, um, but but Toronto Pearson, uh, it's at the point where we have um, a boutique airport on this island in Lake Ontario, and I'm really tempted. I think it's I think it's called Porter Air is the primary. Uh, airline operating out of there. I am so tempted to take a flight via Porter, even though they're more expensive, just to see what it's like to use their airport to get the hell out of uh, Toronto. Um, I've heard good things, but there's also there's also um, a, uh, a special pass you can get. It kind of got screwed over during uh, the Trump years. Um, but it, it's a special pass that allows you to get through customs much faster. Uh, you just go through an advanced uh, application process. And um, I got I was going to apply for that last year, and I got told that the, the the lineup to do so was ridiculous. I mean, not not in terms of lineup, but it's like the waiting period because there's a conflict between uh, Canada and U.S. on um, fees, I think it was. I think it was primarily fees were the issue. And uh, so I think that might be getting resolved. So probably this summer I'm going to apply for it. What's it called again? Um, God, I'm, I'm completely blanking on it. I'll, I'll probably remember it like, you know, two hours before I go to sleep tonight. Um, oh, yeah, it's that. But it, it's uh, I think it's a five star system or tri star or travel star system. It allows you to uh, just go through uh, customs much, much faster. How's that looking so far? I think I'm going to use a thicker ballpoint 
my point threes for the hair uh, on his mutton chops, just to get a different line quality in there, because I can go back in and uh, change that as I go, like uh, add finer lines in the white and the black paint or uh, ink. The later when I go into it after, so I can just do the shadow parts for these. Because Mike draws them like really simple, simplistic uh, black shapes. And since I don't draw in his style, I have to try and capture that with all my, my thousands and thousands of lines. My scritchy, scratchy lines. That looks like hair, I think. This is a case of me putting too much work in one area already, but I, I think it's turning out all right. I do want to But I do want to highlight here in this part of the head, which means I have to be really tricky about this part getting caught by light, this part, the, the cheekbone, the temple, back of the skull, the back of the neck getting hit by light. So I can't let it get too light because then it's going to distort the form. So I got to got to figure out what part gets hit by light, which part doesn't get hit by light. I think there's going to be like, an area in here I have to do some rendering just to, to actually get that tone. I think that means I want this to be really, really light. So I think it means I want to go I know there's kind of like a ridge in the side of the temple with his brow.
Hang on. I think it's working. I think that's working. I think I might use my rubber stamps on this too. I think I got uh, an effect I want to do that having the rubber stamp would uh, would work. So kind of want I want this to be black with a light source coming from there, and I want a light source coming from essentially down here. So I'd want this area to be black to really make that highlight pop. So that means. I can do that. I well, we still don't have any flickering, so maybe that cooling the camera helped, or maybe it was just some other setting that needed to be tweaked. Okay, and I might render this back a bit. It's a little too chunky in terms of visual information. Thing I really like about the, the zero three, opposed to the zero one. Zero one allows me to do a nice range of immediate gradated um, values, as well as very nice light line weight that I can work with. But the three throws down a ton of ink really, really quickly. And it's still a very precision pen, but I can do almost near black cross hatching almost right out, like with two two uh, cross strokes. By cross strokes, I mean the scribbling.
do. I think that's working so far. Hmm. So I want a shadow on the collar of this jacket. Also want to get the Yeah, might have to. Oh shit! I blew past my uh, break. Um, um, let me put together a back in fifteen bit. And um, take my fifteen minute break. And then I'll get right back on Hellboy. Get a mute. I also need ice. Desperately want to drink.
All right, let's get back on this one. Actually, took part of that break to uh, scan the shredder piece and uh, put it up online. All right, well, should really do the BPRD thing, but let's get, you know what? All right, so I'm gonna have to mask him off soon to do what I want here. I could do splatter with this too. I could still mask them off, but uh, do splatter instead. Frisket might be uh, smarter to do with uh, necessarily use my mechanical stamps for this. It's a thread on. I want to knock this back down in value a bit. I really only want, um, might even be better to do it with white paint at the end of it, just knock this really far down. Just want the hint of that, the underbite he has to come across here. So I might go back in here near the end and just put like a super fine line of white so it's that that upper surface that we're not really seeing gets caught by white light yeah i think i'm gonna do that I can switch to the three for uh, this part of the rendering. Now, I think I want this to go more through there.
Hmm. Might just do this like a scribble texture and not use stamps or or spatter at all. Just do a nice like scribble texture. Think about that. I'll sort it out. I'll figure it out. Before I get too far into it, I want to maintain the integrity of the white lines I'm doing here, or the white cutoff. I have two people, yay. I think after this, um, I got asked about doing another smaller Batman painting. I got one that I started. I want to work on that this weekend, but I kind of want to show the initial process for because the other one's already about halfway done, so I can finish it on stream. But I think I want to show the start process for another one where I just go through like my you know 10, 20 different drawing ideas that I land on. The very stiff, uh, probably very typical Batman drawing uh, that everyone always does, but uh, it's basically finding it, finding the drawing I want to finish to start with. So that's that's part of the process, and I'd like you guys to witness it. It's all shiny and chrome. All right, so yeah, let's. Uh, more of a black
let's uh let's do the patcher Not talking a huge amount because my throat is already a little sore. If you have questions, hey, hi, Brendan. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, I will answer them. But uh, unless I'm coming up with like a very specific technique I'm doing, I think I'm going to try and keep the, uh, the, the chatter a little lower um, today. Or maybe not. Maybe that'll be too boring and I'll feel embarrassed about running a, bo uh, a boring stream and, and then just start talking about nonsense. Um, uh, I mean, nonsense is like my favorite new TV show. Like I, uh, if, you, if you haven't seen Shrinking, here I am blathering already. <laughs> if you haven't seen Shrinking, I, I highly recommend it. I, I never thought that uh, Harrison Ford would in one season make me think that taylor sheridan actually knows what he's doing again and also become like one of the best comedic actors on tv uh and two different shows shrinking is 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 gold it is uh came out of nowhere in in my sense i mean has brett goldstein who's in ted lasso he's one of the writers in ted lasso and he's brilliant as the older over the hill gruff retired now retired footballer he's a coach now and he's so good in ted lasso um and he's one of the exact producers i believe writer on uh shrinking which has uh oh god what's his name from uh seagull seagull from how i met your mother and um Ted McGinley, who used to be on uh, Married with Children, who played the uh, the, the Ken Dolver <laughs> husband of the neighbor, uh, and he's so underrated in this. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't have a lot to do, but everything he does, he does incredibly well. Um, and then Harrison Ford is such uh, a revelation in terms of his comedic abilities. I mean, I always thought he was able to do funny. I mean, he was in Working Girl. He's been in comedies. But, and he was, you know, he's the funniest part of Star Wars for the most, most, most of it uh, when he's on screen. And, um, but, oh my God, uh, he is, he's just so good and, 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 and shrinking. You got to watch it, guys. You got to watch it. I ranted a little bit about you know, about media. I mean, uh, I actually waited. I haven't I haven't started watching the last season of Ted Lasso yet. Um, and part of it was a, a on the fly decision. I wanted to see the entirety of Shrinking to put off starting the final uh, season of Ted Lasso because Ted Lasso was so good. And I kind of don't want it to end, but I know it's got to end. Um. So. Um, yeah, so I was putting that off. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm eager to start Ted Lasso now. Um, probably do it this week. Um, it'll be nice to have like a few episodes built up before I start watching. Or correctly. Oh, God. Now I'm trying to remember. He has like a dark leather collar on this coat. So the collar is darker than like it's like a, a light khaki uh, coat with a, a dark leather collar. Yeah, so I can go darker with this uh, this collar. I'm so used to like leaving it all the same one color. But uh, for for a black and white only, never to be colored uh, piece, I think I can go a little darker. Oh, great! Yeah, yeah. Shrinky was just like a surprise. I didn't. I didn't even know it existed initially. A friend of mine said, hey, are you watching Shrinking? Because he knew how much I liked Ted Lasso. And I go, Shrinking, what's that? And then he said, well, it's it's the guy from How I Met Your Mother. And I kind of like, I was like, eh, you know, that guy always, he's funny. There's no, there's no denying the guy's funny, Siegel. And, but there's something he does with his eyes that makes me think he's always a little unhinged, which I guess is good for comedy. Um, but so he on his own wasn't a selling feature, but when I got, uh, um, oh God, I'm blanking on her name too. This one's just my brain being porridge. Like it is at almost every convention, uh, the lead, the lead actress in the series, one of the therapists, she's Jessica Jones. I, I know that's a comic book character, so I might be really fucking up her name. She is so good. And she gets to do most of her scenes with Harrison Ford. And it's so good. And he's so good. She's so good. Uh, even Seagal's really, 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 really good playing this really, really grief-bound character trying to help other people. And uh, I'm already, like, eagerly anticipating the next season of that because I know when I, fin when I finish watching Ted Lasso, that's it for Ted Lasso. Uh, so there's, there's an uh, ongoing sadness. Knowing that that this is this is the situation that we're in in terms of TV, all, all the really amazing stuff's going away. Um, all right, so I know that this is going to be black. So let me leave a key light there. I'm going to draw that. Pull that out of the way there. That's going to be black. It's going to come down there. I'm going to paint out the. Uh, The, the stray remaining hairs that Hellboy has on the top of his head. Yeah, I think I'm going to use my rubber stamps. I think I'm going to use my rubber stamps. I, I used them a little bit. Um, yeah, he was really good in this, uh, Dragon. Um, I, like my, I like my rubber stamps. It requires a little bit of prep, a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of work to get them to do their job, but they're great little tools. I'm so happy I uh, I made them. Uh, there's an artist named uh, Matthew Dow Smith. I oh God, watch me mess up his name. Who I saw was using them, and he's using them for a very almost designing aspect in his work. And I just flash back to how much I loved using uh, uh, Zipatone back before computers made them irrelevant. And it always feels weird to add. This is just me. I don't like adding a black and white art element to black and white art uh, when it's not going to be on the final, the original art when I'm done. All right? I've done it a few times, usually because Deadline just screams at me and I want, I want a screen tone and I don't have uh, the time to actually apply it to the artwork itself. I would, I would actually in Photoshop apply some uh, electronic electronic uh digital um uh, tone uh, patterns and how i do that is i i have a, a file full of a bunch of uh, digital tones i apply them on a layer and i cut away the stuff i don't want and then erase and stuff you know almost like a traditional application of it and i know there's uh i think it's clip studio actually has a brush that allows you to to um effectively uh, draw with a tone pattern which is, you know, pretty damn cool, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm still so much of a traditionalist. It's like I am. I only made two so far. I'm going to make more. 
um, just because uh, I want the increased um, variety that I can get from them by having a wider range of uh, um, screen tone patterns and potential uh, textures I can drop in in my art. That's that's just cool stuff to me. Um, so yeah, I think I got I got a uh, gradated tone here, tone, tone stamp, and it's going to be interesting to try and get um, just that edge going back towards this. It's probably going to have to paint back into it. But I'm going to be you know getting this going on here, uh, stamping, getting going from dark to light on on two different light points. Yeah, so this is going to be dark here. Why am I doing that there when it's going to be here? It's going to be more here. So this is going to be more black. And it's going to come back. So, yeah. Well, I've got some black ink line over here already. I guess I'll just render to it. I'll just render to it. I'll figure it out. Scribble initially the, the obfuscate that edge. You know, the trick is I have so many black areas that have lots of white in it. Do I want to go solid black there? Let me let me go with the almost like a dry brushy brush pen here, just to knock it back and see what I what I think of it there. Can you even see what I'm? No, oh, you can't even see what I'm doing down here. All right, here we go. I think this would be the benefit of like um, uh, friend Eric Canetti used to do a, a really consistent live art stream, um, and Michael D, D. Nicola, which who held his hand, offered to help me a lot. Uh, kind of following out of like doing live Twitch streams, uh, like just watching and chatting. But um, through, I believe it was Discord, you could do audio and chat with uh, people and. Um, I would like that. I would like to be able to do live streams and chat with people. I know I'm going to be adding, now that I got this decent camera here, I'm going to uh, be adding uh, regular uh, Patreon chats, Patreon exclusive chats. And I'll probably do some like just public chats as well. It's, I mean, why not? Um, and to be able to like talk to people while I work and actually answer questions is really appealing. Squeeze some in there, kind of like that. All right, cool. So I can go dark here. Because then people could say, hey, Rich, you're, you're, you're drawing off camera. And I go, don't call me Rich. I, I really don't like being called Rich. Um, It's uh, for reasons, family reasons. I, I, I uh, the people who used to call me rich, um, I don't particularly like. <laughs> All right, so I am going to uh, I'm cut frisket to completely block off Hellboy here, and I'm going to use my rubber stamps and. Uh, maybe some like white paint and other media to uh to get that gradation to like almost like there's a spotlight here and a spotlight fading into here um 
Although, hang on, I could actually, could I do it this way? Just bang. If I do this, I could just go to black before that. So I only, I don't even necessarily have to block up Hellboy on this side. I just have to do it on this side. Because I can do that and that. Let me get this in here a bit. There we go. Still better safe than sorry. I need to cut some frisket. Scrap piece is not enough. Be enough of those only doing the one side. I'm not just doing the one side. I save all these scrap pieces just for that sort of like instance. Although I got two pieces. Hang on. I thought I used this piece already. So I just need to go from there to there. And it would cover, yeah. Well, it wouldn't cover this part. So that's risky. But uh, I think I think I can risk it. Actually, what's it get upside down here? Like, mask off Hellboy there. Covers most of the coat. Goes all the way down to there. And I can just take a piece like from the air and there we go. That's what that is what I will do. All right. More frisket. Again, I, I don't have the laptop as yet set up, so it's immediately in my line of sight, but feel free to ask any questions um, about how I work, what I'm working on. You want to talk about second coming? Um, I mean, uh, the first issue of the third arc is coming out next week. And um, everyone's really excited. Well, everyone, you know, at Ahoy, of course, is really excited about it coming out. I'm excited about it. I think it's, uh, we, we've hit a new level of uh, the way we work together on this book where everything is just firing out all cylinders. I think, I think we're doing, I think the third arc is going to be, I think the second arc was better than the first arc, but it, it dealt with some stuff that uh, was essentially almost set up, pure set up. But um, the the third arc, it just it just lands every single punch that we uh, we throw, if you know what I mean. And Mark's already given me the scripts for the first two issues of arc four, and um, they're brilliant. Um, and I got to tell you, I've done some of my favorite covers of my career so far for this arc, this upcoming third arc. And I think I might be able to top them with the next arc. It's just brilliant stuff, man. Brilliant stuff. So can you see? Okay, good. Don't maybe blocking stuff off. The whole piece should come off. All right. And I got my BPRD symbol over here to use as my frisket catch.
this little piece of scrap just to mask off this stuff back here. here so that's done i just want to do the back of the head now and I'll also take whatever is left here and i'll just mask off here to make sure there's no accidents Cover that. See if I can make this work. Watch me screw it up. <clears throat> I mean, that's that's the benefit of doing it live. You, you you get the opportunity to see me completely bollocks it all up. Um, I could I guess I could do a blooper reel. Oh, that's great. I'm really happy your mother loved it. Um, yeah, it is. Um, it's it's not what it was. I was told it was going to be when I signed up. But boy, am I glad that I did sign up. Do, do, do. Let's start up here, I think. It's not dark enough. I want it darker. When the worry is, is that the overlap of your lines is going to create weird patterns. What you do is you start building weird patterns into it right off the bat. At least that's, that's my solution. So I think I think uh, one of the things that um, is maybe unique me, to me or rare to me is that every tool I get, I perceive as a brush. Um, so the stamp, a lot of people would like stamp done, and I'm like, how can I how can I make it like have an effect, um, both a a noise uh, texture value effect in the work um that's important to me um so if you give me something to play with it's like oh it makes this kind of line and i'm like well can i do this too well you know maybe it shouldn't but i'm gonna try how's it look on the screen so it's like yeah i'll probably go into a little bit of white paint here and there maybe a little white splatter 
but I kind of like the little ghost edge of the white. It'll make that pop a little bit from the background. Um, uh, and I don't know why I drew that X in, in ink because I'm going to be having to go over that in um, in white paint at the end of this uh, because that should not have been, that that was a mistake on my part. Um, I should have done that in pencil. So that was that was a thinking mark, not a not a. It doesn't matter if I need to cover it up later, Mark. Another, another. There. Kind of like, almost like a lens flare effect, but I'm not too precious about it. And I'm going to be doing the same on this side. Also, the messier I make this, the less likely I'm going to have to deal with the uh, moiré pattern. Like you can see, if you can see here, that already looks like a weird kind of screening effect because the, the the dots are coalescing a bit. So the more noise I create with this, the less that that moiré effect kicks in. I even go and use my 20% screen to kind of mess that up a little bit more, which would, you know, be smart. I mean, not that anyone would, you know, accuse me of being smart. Accuse is the right term. Let me do that. So I, I currently I only have two rubber stamps. So this is the gradated one I'm using here. And this is just a very light 20% one. I used it on yesterday's Mobius piece. Uh, are that? And uh, here I can do this. It's a finer screen, uh, but no variations in it. Just just the uh, flat twenty percent value. I can like hit it here, and it, it actually adds a little bit, very subtle amount. Twenty percent is very light. Um, on a not go to white here that much but let's see if i can completely cover it up the value there we go so if i'm doing some white paint effects on top of this i'm gonna have the white pop up in a very different way Same on this side. I'm going to leave some of that white there because I want that white to come out. All right, let's see how this looks and how much I have to correct it with white paint. Like to lift it up. It's always easier with this. Myself with my knife. Oh, I got most of it off in one go. And 
again, most of it, not all of it. Um, when I did a little bit of this yesterday, I talked at length that I have to be extra careful when I when I use the rubber stamps because the ink doesn't really dry on the frisket very well. So just by handling the frisket, I got that much ink already. Just that one little bit of frisket that touched my fingers got that much ink, and that would go all over the yard. And it's also a bit of a risk with the uh, the tape because it won't dry on the tape that quickly. But this did pretty much what I wanted to, except for here. I couldn't get in there, so I'm going to uh, add some, break that down a little bit. Make this a little harder to make that nose pop a bit more. I think I might go with white paint and just bring that underside of the brow out and make it pop a bit more. And go in there with some uh, another layer to get that darker. That's why I'm using the uh, the one right now. Should use the three. I think I'll do another layer. Oh, let me actually use this. Get some nice dry brushy bits happening here. And since I have it ready,
But you know what? I just realized I should probably cover up my laptop when I splatter like this. Let me just see if throw that old t-shirt over it. And I don't need to frisk it again, but I will dig up my post-its wherever I tossed them last night. I don't need a couple of Just give me a, a little protection on uh, the details I don't want to risk losing. And I don't want to get white paint on my drawing tools. Sure, I don't want to have too much on the brush. I want to do very, very faint. I was like, there's a reflected light in dirty air right here. Right here. I think that one's done. You guys think? Yeah, I tossed another latex glove. I got signed this, of course, still. Let me mute it while I hit with the airbrush. The airbrush, hair dryer. All right, I think I just came on something I want to try as well. I'm just going to add a little bit of just a little bit of gradation here at the bottom, a little bit more of residual ink from the rubber stamp just to create some like it's just a 20%. So it's barely going to be visible to the eye, but it's going to be there and I'm going to know it. So yeah, that one's done. Let me uh, peel off the tape and sign it. Hopefully not getting any ink on my fingers from the tape. 
All right, I didn't draw the border in ink yet. I can do that. Maybe I don't need to. Maybe I can erase it and just let the uh, white take care of it. I think I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. Move. Oh, there's the blue dot I made to to know where I wanted to do the dot, so I'll hit that with a little bit of white paint too. And let this go away as well. I don't care if the pencil doesn't fully erase on the sides where I did a lot of stuff. Well, I like how that disappear. I like that disappear here. And little stick deep, trusty stick deep brush. Yeah, I got to do a little bit more erasing on the side. Uh, that's... Yeah, I think that's. Uh... I don't. Oh, I still want to do a little bit of uh, white paint stuff here. Looking at this. Fine white paintbrush. Don't use a really bad. I can use a really bad for what I'm wanting to do here, but I think uh, super fine little little paintbrush is probably better. Although this one, this one's really, really. I've beaten the hell out of this one for so long. It really should get like a new. Like this is what. It's actually a point. It's a, it's a double zero. I mean, we're talking about as fine as you can get. So it's almost a non-existent brush. Just want, I just want a little bit of. Yeah, it's not giving me pigment. So old. All right. Just want like a little bit, a little bit of white right here. That light could be hitting. Wow, oh, it's. it's... I think there's a dried blob of pigment in the tip and it's stopping it from just letting the other paint flow. Hmm. I need to wipe it down with the, oh, oh, there we go. Oh my God, all the bristles just fell off. There's like, I don't know if there's any way you can see that. There's like literally one hair left on this brush. All of the other ones just broke. <laughs> well, that sucks. Um, let me try gel pen quickly. It might just put down enough pigment to make it work. Um, where's our test? Okay, so this one's running. No, it's on top of other pens, so it's not going to. Excuse me. Super fine brush. Oh, one, I think there might be my, my traveling watercolor kit. I don't want it to go dig them out. Mm -hmm.
that's done. I mean, sign this puppy. See one thing here. All right. Wow. So this is the this is now the fourth piece I finished for C2E2 at home. I'll probably scan it on my next break, which is in 45 minutes. Cool. So what am I going to do for 45 minutes? Um, I do know I have the Batman painting that's in progress. And I got asked about doing another uh, Batman painting that will go with one of the Doom the King of Gotham books. So that's a, that's a smaller Batman painting. So how about I how about I draw Batman? I'll draw Batman for forty five minutes, and either I'll pick up on the one that's already started, or actually start painting the one I'm sketching on on stream. Scan Hellboy during the break. What do I want to work on today? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm just holding up. Oh, it's getting a little warm again. I have to put the cold pack on the uh, on the camera again soon. There we go. That's sort of straight. There we go. There we go. Ish. Mm hmm. I'll come over the permanent placement for that camera sooner than later. Let me take a drink here. I'm also just checking social media because I got asked some questions on social media. That's right to give him the cadence link, which I thought I gave out already. That's that. All right, cool. Sorted. Drinking. All right, so a little preamble. Let me see if I can find a Batman trade on hand. Here we go. So I uh, a few weeks ago I started doing uh, some bat. I, I got this big box of Batman trades uh, in advance of the movie, which I believe is uh, is gone live now. Uh, I've seen a lot of positive reviews. I see. I I read one review that was just laughable. Um, uh, and how and they just didn't seem to get anything. Oh, hang on. They didn't get seem seem to understand anything about the movie. Um, and they completely forgot I was I was a part of it. So that's like, okay, that's a little insulting. Um, but anyway, uh, I got a box of these and my friend Troy Nixie, uh, who did the art in the series ultimately, um, he started doing commissions to go with the trade. I'm like, that's a brilliant idea. And um, and I told him I was gonna steal his idea. And I, I kind of felt bad because Oh, these aren't it. Um, I didn't want to do exactly what he was doing because I mean that's that's what he's doing. So I decided, well, I haven't painted nearly as much as I want to this year. So I had the idea, well, how about I paint these Batman? And um so that's what I did. I painted like uh five or so Batmans um on paper, actually bigger than this. These, these are smaller than what I painted on. I thought these were the extra paper. I can cut fresh paper um on watercolor paper and they're big enough to fit in the book so on six six by ten sheets because this this looks more like um 
seven by eight, actually. Uh, so I ended up doing these paintings on uh, seven by eight. They're all they're all gone to my art rep, so I don't have any to show on camera, but I'll show some this weekend. Um, and so apparently I have a few left over. And uh, next weekend I'm going to a signing at uh, Kingston uh, Nexus uh, Games and Hobbies, Kingston Comics. Um, doing a signing for this trade and first issue of Second Coming um, Trinity. And um, uh, yeah, so um, I got asked about doing another painting in, in this format. And I have the trades. I'm getting more trades in, so I'm going to do that. And uh, someone from my Patreon asked me to do a slightly larger, uh, an 8 by 10 painting of Batman to go with the trade. He's going to get assigned trade two. And uh, that's the one I started. And I'll probably I'll definitely finish it before this weekend. I'll do it on camera so you can see how I finish a painting. And I'm going to start drawing the, the Batman piece I'm going to do for the one that I was asked about, separate from C2E2 at home. That's what I'm doing. Oh, cartoon drawing of me should my avatar. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. That was, did uh, I throw that out? I don't know if I caught a likeness of myself. I, I really, I really don't. I don't think I caught a likeness of myself. I mean, it's sort of me, personality-wise, but I don't think it resembles me that much. Uh, All right, let's. Hmm. Still getting used to the whole streaming thing. Obviously, it's my second day ever streaming at all. Um, so, like the idea of the camera floating here in my where my head would normally go um, is a little much. Um, I'll probably, man, maybe I could push it up a bit and zoom a bit. That might be smart. All right. So, um, I've done a lot of headshots of Batman. I'm trying to think. Uh, I haven't done Batman in the rain in a long time, but I haven't, I don't think I've painted Batman in the rain for a long time. Uh, hmm. it's, well, it's a very tall format, so I think maybe I'll do uh, more of a full, full figure Batman painting. I mean, to me, Batman's a shape. He's best when he's represented as a, as a shape because um, his details are kind of comical. If you know what I mean. Um, I mean, the more detail you draw in Batman, the more ludicrous he looks. Unless your style automatically takes takes all that stuff into account. Drawing Batman in a book is, is, I wouldn't say it's on my bucket list because, I mean, he's done appearances and stuff I've drawn. Uh, I co-wrote Batman Doom Became a Gotham. Um, so I've done Bat stuff. I've still, I, I still got Batman ideas. Uh, so there's part of me that still wants to do Batman. Um, as From a creative standpoint, but I don't know that I'm at the point where it's like, I need to do Batman. Um, I, I've got a lot of other projects in development that have that are, that are I, I alone. So the idea of of working on Batman, um, Googie, what's Googie? So Goofy. There we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I mean, um, uh, I think Brian Boland uh, did the Ultimate Batman, where where he actually had to flare out bat ears. Uh, back in the day. Oh, wow, that's really I'm drawing inordinately high up here. We, we did, did the big, you know, Batman bat ears uh, in that, uh, I think he did it in the first appearance of Batman as a flashback in The Killing Joke. Gave him those big, big flat out ears. Uh, the spike ears are the ones I like uh, to draw. Uh, and But they're they're intrinsically silly. As, as Silver said, I mean, it's like, 
they don't serve a purpose. I mean, there's been comic writers that come up with reasons. I mean, I think they even did something about the ears in, in uh, the Batman movie with Christian Bale. Um, oh, but he's, he's not a bat, man. Man bat's a bat. Um, that we have that that weird vest. Buckle, pouch, pouch, pouch. We're only getting six pouches aside. We're not going to do any of the Liefeld nonsense. Um, I mean, oh my God, that uh, Razorback, that Razorback um, Marvel Universe handbook. Can I throw it out? I think I threw it out. Um, oh, here it is. Drawing this, looking at, looking at the Marvel handbook uh, turnaround of Razorback and all those pouches going all the way around his back. And I'm like, what is he? Those pouches are tiny. I mean, his arms are like 50. He has 50 inch arms. Um, and then he has pouches that he may not be able to physically move his arm to grab. Like, what What is this pouch right here in the middle of his back above his buttocks? I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Why are there so many pouches? Um, I know that in the military, I've, I've had to draw military and police uniforms. I know how what gear they put on the back of their their uh the service belts um and they're not closed pouches where you have to kind of like hope you get the right pouch and then dig into it and hope you pull out the right thing they reach around they grab the right thing it's 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 an obvious thing uh, i figure batman would be the same way he probably has stuff on the back of his belt that you can't see with his cape um on top of that he's in in in, in this series he, he's got a revolver um it's, i don't think he actually uses it at any point but it's there it's part of the costume design and it's really prominently held in, on the cover here um so he's packing he's packing a 45 um and uh yeah, ain't nothing you're going to be able to do about that, man. I mean, uh, Batman's got a gun. Um, so two pouches, pistol, and then three pouches on this side. And um, I'm going to let this go as dark as possible. I got the the, uh, the bats. Let me get this out of here. <laughs> I'm out of 11 by 14 pads. 11 by 14 uh, um, Borden Riley 37 marker layout pads are my favorite things to draw on. I have 14 by 17 because that's why I end up drawing a lot of like the bigger stuff on. Um, but like if I'm just figuring out a panel or um a figure or something i don't need all this paper for it and it so it feels a bit like a waste so it's it's kind of important for me to have those uh smaller pads and um they're just not carried that much in canada anymore i i i know that i believe the company chart pack bought borden riley paper um they don't get a huge amount of distribution in canada I, don't, I can't remember the last time I saw a chart pack marker uh, uh, for sale anywhere. So I have to um, either make do with 11 by 17s, which are a lot easier to find because I think a lot of schools still uh, uh, get students to work with them um, or special order them. Uh, so I just checked uh, the place I normally get them is Curry's, which uh, is a local art chain up here. And they've kind of had a couple of uh, setbacks during the pandemic. They they used to be the biggest art retailer in Ontario, maybe in Canada. Um, 
and they had two stores in Toronto, a store in Whitby, a store in Markham, a store in Hamilton, a store in London. And since the pandemic, they're down to the store in Hamilton, which is a uh, mid-sized city, uh, quite a bit away from, like about 70 kilometers away from me. And London, which is uh, a couple hours drive from where I am. That's it. They're down to that. Um, and uh, so I think they're going more online in terms of retail. Um, because I think a lot of art sales are going online now. But it, it kind of sucks that that one of the larger art retailers in Ontario essentially is uh, non-existent in Canada's biggest city. It 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 sucks. It sucks to be me. I mean, uh, it's actually at the point where I was talking with my son about possibly doing a, a road trip to the states, ostensibly to hit a Blick store. Um. Because I, I do like I do like a big, well-stocked art supply store. Size matters, and um, and Dick Blick, especially the Chicago one. Again, I, I wish I was in Chicago with all you, with all the people in Chicago. But here I am in my studio. Um, but Dick Blick, Chicago, two floors of art supplies, man, two floors. That's that's an artist's wet dream right there. Got that, got that coming from the button. That button coming in. Shadow country there. So I'll do a tunnel drawing before I do a painting because um, it allows me to get all of the value aspects of the painting sorted out before it starts. So this is going to fade to dark. I have all this in shadow. In fact, I'm going to pull out a bigger pencil. To make this go faster. So many pencils are closer. Uh, that's two H though. That's this uh it's two B. Here we go. So I get to do all the value figure figure figuring outing. That'll that'll probably make for the size of the piece what i'll do is i'll uh i'll take the line drawing from this i'm going to tone this down a bit have that go in the shadow too i'll do a line drawing of this scan that print the line drawing on the watercolor paper or i might just redraw it again on the watercolor paper. Um, now I'll print it out, that'll be faster. I don't want you guys waiting for me to redraw the same thing like who knows how many times. But I'll have this. Uh, Yeah, I can make them fade into the, the fogs of the Gotham night.
that's a that's a wee little Batman drawing. Um, How much of a fog do I want there? I can really sort that out. I can do it in like layers of white paint on top of it after. But if I have a kneaded eraser on hand instead of just my. Okay, they're exacto blades. Where is my kneaded eraser? Hmm. I did just use it uh, before the constant. Oh, well, I don't need it that much. I can actually do what we do this. Is it a paper towel? Soften this. And then take the Moo eraser. Get that effect again. I don't know, does that, does that show up in the camera pretty well? It does. I... Oh, is it pulsing again? Yeah, it's pulsing again. Let me um, let me grab the cold pack again and see if that takes care of it before I start uh, doing any more work in this button piece. Here, back. Uh, here we go again with the uh, cold pack, this time pre-wrapped in paper towels to keep it from ripping. Lift this up, tighten the clamp a bit. Doesn't seem to be pulsing right now. Let me take a look at it on a horde of angry Rob. I didn't say anything. I mean, Rob. Draws pouches. I mean, that's, I mean, he's leaned in there too. He ended up designing a character that was entirely pouches at one point. Um, uh, it looks a little out of focus, but it's, uh, it's not throbbing right now. That's a good thing. Um, yeah, see here, I'm going to go for another. 15 minutes. So there's part of me that's really, really tempted to scan the value thing. So I want I want seven by 10 art paper. I need to cut that too. My ruler is a ruler. So if I did this. Yeah, so it's going to be six. So I have to trim in. This might be the a good size to actually do this painting. 
scan it, maybe make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do that. It'll save me some time. Scan it up, blow it up a little bit, trace it off, scan that again. Um, print it on the watercolor paper, and I have larger sheets on hand. So what I might do is uh, print it on a larger sheet of watercolor board, and then trim it down to the size that fits in the book. That might be the smarter thing to do in terms of time management for today's count con. But I'm pretty sure I can scan, print, trace off this. Um, at the center. And the came to Gotham. All right. Board, the support. More questions here. Side, I'm going to go around here. Six. And I think it's seven by 10, so seven by nine, I'm cool. And sorry, track of the edges, canvas size. Print. Settings going to go to cassette one. Oh, sorry, that's a four. There we go. And print. What I've done for this painting is I've I did that drawing. I liked it enough that instead of redoing a new one, I scanned it, made it a little bit bigger. I'm going to trace it off, turn it into a line drawing. And uh, then I'm going to put that in the watercolor paper. And then I'm going to paint it for you guys. You can see the whole painting process. Which I hope you enjoy. And again, I'm using way larger paper than I normally use to draw on because my paper pads are not available.
I have to get these the special order. Um, At the slightly larger size, I can embellish a bit too, which is good. see what I'm doing yeah okay it's a little on the high side of things let me angle this up a bit uh, that may be too high there we go I think one of my favorite parts of this costume design over all the other Batman costume designs is that kind of like tube color, no idea what it's called, and that button up um, panel uh, from his, his, uh, his costume here. It's just that those are the cool parts to me. Down like that. Keep that in mind. Buttons. I want this all to fade into like one shape more than detailed stuff. So to keep that in mind. So I'm going to do lighter pencil work so it will disappear into the colors. Let's get this bat. I think I drew the bat ears too big initially. Let me draw them smaller. I'm saying invariably, unless I'm doing the red painting like I am, else uh, the other one, I invariably, oh, this is off, I'm gonna go black inside the bat, uh, bat symbol on his chest. So, so I'm gonna cut some of that off there. Maybe I'm gonna pull this down a bit more too. Let's make it here smaller. Never happy. I have to always tinker. I'm going to draw the whole shape just because the symmetry uh, helps, even though it's, I want it to disappear into the shadow here. Yeah. 
There we go. Buttons drawn. Maybe a little higher. I think I can never remember after all this time is how exactly Batman's belt was done in this book. I had it in my hand and just put it down somewhere. For example, there. Yeah. Oh, that piece. I know I have more lying around, but oh, here it is. Troy did some amazing stuff on this book. Oh my God. See if we can get a good shot. There we go. So it is, if you want to see it, just a weird little round buckle. So I'm not far off with this buckle here. Just going to do another circle inside it, and now I'll just figure it out when I'm painting. I got pouches coming off or hanging off the belt. Or the yellow bat buckles, of course. Revolver. No revolver, sorry, the uh, pistol. I need to do uh, too much there because it's so far behind. The shadow of everything is going to be the darkest aspect on that. Well, of, of the light things and, and hanging off his belt, the, the the holster for his revolver is going to be the, the darkest up. And so I don't have to worry about its shape too, being too precise, just as long as it's suggested to be there. That makes sense. And I'll do this belt. Pouch. I'm going to leave it like that. So, want the shadow to go like that. So, I'm probably going to get some shadows on in the bat symbol, signal symbol as well. So, I definitely want to get the thing of that. So, that's going to happen like that. Okay, I think that's uh, what I'm going to run with for the pen. Box for it. This will fit in the book, right? Yeah, it will fit. I've been watching a lot of um, Forged in Fire or Fury or whatever, um, the knife making show. And there's that guy who always goes, Will it cut? Will it kill? And it's like, yeah, this will fit. It will fit. Sorry, I'm being nerdy about a TV show that I don't know anyone else watches. He's not wide enough on this side. He's actually short. I, I drew him too short. Let me just uh, fix this. He's got that Ben Affleck thickness happening there. Um, eraser there. I don't want this sign to disappear a bit, so I'm going to lighten the line a bit, so it'll be easier to. I'm going to have to go back and with white paint on that. Am I happy with the ears? Mm. 
Yeah, I think I think I will. Uh, that's a little thicker. There we go. Okay, let's get this painting started. Yeah. Hi, Nick. Uh, yeah, I love that that collar. That collar is just the coolest thing. Um, if if I were going to draw a Batman series, I'd probably want to see if we could incorporate that collar, as at least implied neck protection. Um, I'd like that. My bigger paper. But I actually have some eight by 10, which is not much bigger than this. So I can print it on eight by 10 watercolor paper, attach it to my watercolor block, and then just trim it down as needed. Yeah, that fits in two. I just I print it more to one side. And it's very crooked, so I'm going to use the straightening tool. Photoshop the straightening before I print it on the artboard. Straighten. Boom. Uh, print settings, gray, bottom size, eight by 10, cardstock. And do I want to print center and trim both sides or do I want to print it to one side and just trim to one? Let's do that. It gives me weird thing like that, but actually gives me an area to touch colors on, which I don't generally have when I'm doing these small paintings. I gotta change. Um, size 10, K, type cardstock. All right, well, cool. Um. 
So when I'm painting, um, I'm using painting on drawings transferred to watercolor paper. Um, otherwise, like I'm using a watercolor block when I'm out in the road, like if I'm painting plain air uh, in a park or somewhere. Not there for now. So I got these wonderful foam core boards that you can just staple your artwork on and it keeps it from stretching. I should probably soak this a bit first um, before I staple it. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, uh, one of them is putting it in a tub of water for like 10 minutes or so. Um, the other way is to just let it lay on um, wet top paper towels. And let it absorb via capillary action all the moisture. That's what I'm going to do because I get to do that on camera. Otherwise, I'll look in a, in a different room in my apartment. Talking about stuff that, you know, you guys can't see. I'm just going to push that there. Little worried about the extra edge over here that I'm I'm not soaking as much, but I'm sure I'll, I'll spray spray wet somehow. Wow, look at all that graphite on my hand already. Hands get dirty in the studio, man. Who knew being an artist was this dirty a job? And also, uh, the ink gets lifted a bit from the printing, so then it, it disappears under the watercolor a lot better. And I guess I'll, I guess I have to put some extra paper towel on the edge there. Get that edge properly wet. Now, the reason we do this is watercolor paper um, expands when it fills with water, and then as it dries, it contracts. And what that generally means is if you're not using incredibly, like they, they do sell watercolor board, um, which is, you know, expensive and tedious and awful to carry and all that stuff. Um, well, what you do if you soak the uh, the paper so it absorbs a lot of water, so it's at its maximum water absorption, and then you affix it either to a hardwood board with a power stapler, or these wonderful gator boards um, that people started making available for artists a little while ago. Um, it, it's it's stretched as they call it, like like uh, a canvas or or, or that. And um, so as it dries, it dries flat because it's stretched on a flat surface. And um, and so that means I can do all the painting and not worry about buckling and weird, weird puddles and stuff like that occurring in the work. So I just want to leave this for a few minutes. Any questions in the mm, Nope. Uh, and I am heading towards a break shortly. Um, maybe I'll take that break now and, um, let this absorb and I'll pick this up after it's been sitting for like, well, I'm taking a half hour break now. Um, yeah, I'll let that soak for, for that, that time. All right. Uh, what's, oh, yeah, I'll do it here. Do it in this one. Here we go. Um, my marker. Uh, what time is it now? I'll be back in half an hour, so I'll be back at 4 p.m.
All right, I'm back. Still chewing the last bite of food. Made myself a quick sandwich, yum. Um, okay, so. All right, so uh, just to make it clear, what I'm going to do is I've been soaking the Batman drawing on the Gator board, as I uh, showed you earlier. Um, the idea is to, um, here's, here's the other one I'm working on. This is one's about half done. I basically put down a dark gray wash and some red washes. Um, uh, just to get the base colors, you can see where I actually splattered the, some of the dark gray underneath the red to add, add some texture and stuff. So basically, I did the dark gray wash, a light wash on top of it. I tried to avoid getting any red in the eyes and then a wash of red on it, which kind of lightened up the gray a bit. Um, so when I go back in with uh, watercolors and then acrylics and gouache, uh, I'm going to be darkening everything and pushing the reds and stuff like that. So. There's a chance I'll be finishing this tomorrow on stream, but if you can see the staples and the painter's tape, um, that's because I wet this first. So, it, and you can see how flat it is. So if I turn on an angle, you can see that there's no buckles or anything in that surface. And that's what I want to do because this is now sitting for half an hour. And uh, now I have all these wet rags I got to toss out. Um, so, this should be thoroughly absorbed or absorbed enough water that it's expanded. Yeah, I can feel it. it there, there's a, almost like a fabric like quality to 100% cotton watercolor paper when you've uh, when you wetted it, like it, it's just floppy like that. So what I'm going to do is I fix it to the board, make sure there's no bubbles in there. I take my stapler. Ah, and this is, might be loud. Hopefully, it's not too loud. And what I do is I put a staple in the bottom, and uh, then I take my nails, run it up, kind of give it a bit of a stretch, and then I pop in a staple here at the top in the middle. And uh, yeah, this is ex the excess paper because I use larger paper, and I, I I normally use for these books. So I'm going to put a staple in the middle here. So this is going to buckle up uh, while it dries. I, I thought I washed my hands, but it's still dirty. Look at that. That's, I wonder if that's paint or marker or something. Yeah, so from this point, um, what I do is you can actually I don't I don't know if you can see it on camera, but the 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 dark ink value dropped after I soaked it, um, which is what I want because I, I don't really necessarily want the black line work to survive the painting process. Now, for me to get the tape, uh, the tape, painter's tape to stick, I have to let it dry. Um, so it means I can't really work on it right away. It took a couple of hours I can. Um, so I could, uh, you know what? I just, just got in. One of, one of my, my favorite people on Facebook just uh, commissioned a uh, Conan. And I love Conan. Um, so I think what I'll do is now that I got this stapled, I'm going to put it aside. I'm going to throw a couple of staples in there. I don't want that buckling. The extra staples won't matter anyway, because I'm going to be cutting that paper off anyway when it's done. So I just got a, uh, a 9 by 12 Conan full figure piece in. Uh, so I think I'll start that because, you know, any opportunity to draw Conan is is an opportunity indeed. And um, and I do do like me some Conan. So. Yeah, OK, so this is this reiterate. This is part of my painting process. 
So I transfer the drawing to the watercolor paper. Uh, I soak it, uh, which stretches. So all the cotton fibers absorb water uh, and they expand. I put it on the gator board, which is, um, let me pull this up a bit, see if, uh, Oh, it's not going up, but you can see the thickness of the board. It's about half an inch thick, maybe a little over. Uh, and I've been, you can see all these little indentations from previous paintings. Um, I just stapled the, the work into it. And uh, the staples are enough to keep the paper from um, returning to its original dry size. Okay, so it's fully stretched. It's at the maximum stretch. So when it dries, it will dry stretched and flat. And so this is a piece I worked on earlier this week. You can see I did a little little bit. And the problem with watercolor is it lifts, right? And um, and so there's little bits of the pencil drawing still existing. I think you can still see them. Um, I, I put down a wash. And the trick to getting a smooth wash like this is is you very carefully get that surface wet again and then you let the color even out and i look at the camera it actually looks more even on camera than it does in person there's a, a little bit of a flicker in the screen right now um and then i did another layer of light dark wash just black and uh to get kind of like this so it was, it was just a black and white piece and then i gave it a red wash uh cadmium red medium and i picked up some of the black so it went a little grayer than red normally does so to get the red to pop i'm gonna have to use uh probably some um cadmium red acrylic i might go back in and like paint in the eyes and, and this this is almost done honestly this little part here is part of the face let's see if i can pull it up there that's almost done uh, the values stuck. I was just painting my white. Some of the pencils remaining, so it's adding detail, which I like. Um, but I really kind of want that. Um, I did another Batman piece like this, but he's holding a batarang, and 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 the person who commissioned this really loved that piece. Um, he wanted to try and buy it when they went for sale on my art rep cadence.com. Um, so I'm doing them, but I'm doing it with the the handgun that he has in uh, Doom that came to Gotham. I'm seeing that the ears are uneven. I got to go back in. I, uh, I, I got to fix those ears. Um, but yeah, so this, this definitely, I'll probably definitely finish that tomorrow. This piece, uh, when it's dry, I'm going to tape off the border as I do, and it'll be ready to be painted. I might, uh, after I finish the Conan, what I might do, if this is dry enough, I might put the initial washes on like I did with, uh, this piece. So you can see what I, I'm not quite sure what I, I'm probably going to do like blue and green uh with the gray and the batman uh for that nice kind of like combination of uh blue green gray earthy urban dirty not earthy urban dirty colors um and just get the basic colors in there and uh and i have more chest details in here this one I, this one i want more of a strong silhouette it's off centered so i i want that strong batman and the idea of the gun over here um i almost did something where i did like an edge of a building like in an earlier drawing i did an edge of a building and then i had the gun as as white like the the reversed uh bat symbol but uh didn't want to take the risk and have it look ass when it was done so i just like this shape this diagonal across the page and the strong verticals from batman essentially just on half the image so i think this will be nice and i think this will be nice because it's batman and um of fun doing that too but let's get on to conan hither came conan okay so i i a little while ago i should i throw these things out so so often a little while ago i um i, I got in the habit of uh looking at john bashima inked conan stuff because there's so many wonderful reprints out there. And uh, I was looking at how much he had that Jack Palance um, facial structure. Um, like the the eyes, the, the massively wide cheekbones. And I mean, that comes from Frank Frazetta's uh, The Barbarian, right? Um, 
uh, when he when he first painted them, he based his uh, his Conan on uh, on Jack Palance. I mean, Jack Palance had an amazing face. I mean, uh, and he's also done some uh, pretty pretty amazing roles. I mean, this is this is me without looking at John Machine, so I'm, I'm I'm certainly screwing up the features, but it's like those those cheekbones are essentially wider than the fore edge of the skull. That's a, that's amazing. I mean, Conan is still on my bucket list. I mean, so because Frank Frazetta and um, and Conan the Barbarian Savage Sword, the big black and white John Bushima magazine at the time, I got in the really interested in drawing comics. Um, those were those were like every single month I needed those. I needed those Savage Swords. And. Um, And this is not the drawing. This is me warming up towards Conan because I always, always end up doing more drawing for Conan than than finished stuff because it's just so much fun. Here I am. I'm just trying to channel a little bit of that Big John stuff. Those eyes are barely. I think I think of the time. I think Neil Adams did a really good Conan too. I love there was. At least one issue I can recall where Basema was inked by uh, Adams and the people at Continuity. And it was just gorgeous. I don't know if I have that reprint yet. I'm tempted to go and like see what what the closest conan comic i have to me is right now soften that a bit yeah i love drawing conan there's like especially oh my god the, the old savage sword the old savage swords magazine when it when it had like I mean, it didn't. It didn't have to follow the comics code, right? So it had decapitations and nudity. I mean, all the stuff that you knew was in in the Robert E. Howard stories, but Marvel couldn't do in in the, in the code approved comics. Uh, that was like, oh my god! It was like I talked yesterday about uh, getting heavy metal when I was way too young to get it. It was like uh, no one in my family, even for a moment, thought about checking Savage Sword of Conan. And it's like one of my first issues was in the 50s or 60s of the magazine's run. Um, there's a scene where a woman gets out of bed and she puts on a, a light robe. And um, and she's she's naked. It's a, it's a full on nude figure drawn by John Mishima. And, um, and I was like, oh, my God, this is great. <laughs> I mean, I was a teenager. What do you expect? Um and uh, I think that was one of the last actual bits of nudity uh, in the magazine. Uh, it was just such a beautifully drawn figure. It was like, it was like Buscema getting to do effectively classical art. And I loved it. Um, Marvel's been doing these gorgeous, you know, what, one second. I, I know where I got one handy right now. <laughs> Well, that was disappointing. I, I had a vision in my head exactly where the last hardcover Conan collection I bought was sitting, and it's not there. I, I must have moved it somewhere, and I'm kind of heartbroken. But, uh, I mean, Big John's Conan was just so good. You know what? I'm going to go pick one up. Hang on, hang on. Uh, John... Images. 
Oh, this is probably the most famous Bissema Conan. I mean, I mean, my God, look at that. Isn't that perfection? I mean, there's there's stylization in here that that no one else really does. I mean, the curvature in the shin is is cartoon. I mean, the shin doesn't it, there's a curve. There, there isn't that curve. Um, he just was a master at his art form at this point. I mean, the the brushwork, oh my god, you, you can see the feathering, just this natural flick. With how he, he did the, the brush all the way through everything just to get it working nice textures and that that furry diaper um i mean it's like this is actually i think i did a couple of uh, copies of this just just some loose sketches um and his ability as a cartoonist like if if you look at this hand he drew you you realize it's not particularly, you know, advanced drawing of a hand. It's a very simple, almost like calligraphy element of a hand. It's it's a an interpretation of what a hand could be. Whereas this hand is a real, you know, this is a real organic hand existing in space. This is just, you know, knuckles, but it works. It works so well. You can learn so much. Like, I mean, I think there's a reason why How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way is still one of the best go-to books for learning how to draw um because Buscema knew a shit I mean no one would ever doubt that big John knew a shit um and I learned so much from him I mean even there, like you got again you got his brow here and and the cheekbones are wider coming in under here so I mean as busy as my drawing is it it doesn't exist without John what John did um I, I tend to give Conan more of a broken nose than John did. John did this. Oh, yeah, I got to tell you. Okay. Um, if you don't know, there's a new Conan series coming out. Uh, written by Jim Zub and Roberto De La Torre. And it, I've seen, Jim showed me some of the pages. And it is the most gorgeous Conan has maybe ever been. Um, the drawings his, his sense of getting Conan's physicality is, is near impeccable. Um, and it's Jim's up. So, you know, the story is going to be banger. I mean, it's, it's really, it's just going to nail what exactly you want out of a Conan story. What he did at Marvel. I mean, it makes perfect sense that the new publishers of Conan bring him over because I think Jim's, I like what, I like what Kurt Busick did. Um, uh, I, I, I got a kick out of what Tim Truman was doing when he was at the Dark Horse book. Um, but no one since then was able to capture, you know, Robert E. Howard, that sense of uh, the fantasy world, any of that stuff better than Jim. So I'm, I'm super excited to see what it's coming. I mean, uh, following, you know, th those artists, um, seeing what uh, Bruno's doing. It's just, it's just amazing work. Yeah. So here's my pinched up, beat up looking Conan sketch, initial sketch. I'm almost tempted to redraw this as a figure. That would be, although, you know, honestly, it's been done so many times. Uh, there's part of me that would uh, want to change it up somewhat. There's also, there's, the straight on view is a little weird. There's, there's a, a way that Buscema drew Conan in a three quarter view. Actually, this cover is what you guys can't see. Um, this cover is 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 just genius. Open with the new tab. Okay, so I'm prevented from seeing that in high res. That sucks. Okay, here we go. Let me print this. Print. And a really good three quarter view in high res. Because there's some something with the way the Senate drew Conan in three quarters that that just had so much gesture. He had so much gesture in his face. 
Here's yeah, here's here's uh look at that cover. Look at that. Ooh. Right? I mean that's that's classic tone in there. Uh, that's a rough little sketch. This works. Should I print this one? Oh no, this one. Here we go. This one's just got so much raw physicality to it. And printing it up because I don't do the whole desktop share thing. So, and print this. I mean, hey, if I'm live streaming from home and I got access to, to the ability to show people stuff right away, I, I think I'd have to be a bit of an ass not to show it. I mean, here. So look at this one. Look at this sketch. Look at that. Look. Oh, my God. And I got to tell you, this energy, you get that in spades in the new Conan book coming. I think it's Titan. It is. And it's the Conan properties. People have taken it over. And it is gorgeous. Just look at that. That face there. Right. Oh, my God. Yeah. And this part of, part of me kind of want. I think I think I might do a version on this. My own version. I'm not, not copying Jim. But, like, there's the pose. The classic pose with like the rock, I do the rock, maybe, maybe the trailing weird smoke, but just get this Conan figure. I think, I think that's a, that's a learning opportunity. I, I get to make a fan happy and I get to draw based on a Bishama pose. So, and yeah, I think I'm going to do that. Uh, I hope, I hope he doesn't mind. Um, I'm pretty sure he's a, he's a big John fan too. Uh, huh? Let me drink something here. Nope. Oh, here we go. I made someone jump. All right. <laughs> all right. So, uh, again, I'm not going to... Is it on screen at all? It's not on screen at all. There we go. Hmm, I wonder if I can... If I move the camera back up here and tighten the thing up here. And get more of it on there. I don't need the, the full page. How's that? How's that? That show? Yeah, because I can I can work I can work with this. I, I don't just doing the basic figure for a nine by twelve. I can do this. Uh, if I want it to stay there, so let me grab some of that magic painters tape I always use. Should I risk playing the Conan soundtrack? Should I risk it? Maybe if I play it subtly enough, they'll they'll let it slide. Let me get rid of some of this paper I don't need. Here we go. There we go. It gives me a little bit more drawing space. And let me pull up Amazon Music and we play some Conan. Do, 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 do. Can you tell I'm excited about you know playing drawing Conan? There we go. Opened. Well, the last thing I listened on the Amazon Music was the Dracula soundtrack. Wow, it looks like I'm only able to pull up the prologue. Huh. Oh, hang on. What's this? Transcribed for organ? <laughs> the stuff like you cannot see that I'm. Uh, uh, wow. Maybe maybe this soundtrack is not available on Amazon, I think, you know? Um, that that kind of sucks. Um, it's got the 3D Conan soundtrack, which is actually pretty good. You know what? It's it's I have I know I'd hang on and see if I can find it. It's my Google Tunes here. I haven't played music directly off my computer for so long. Um
oh, you know what might have it? YouTube music might have it. I mean, let me go to YouTube. I'm, I'm streaming on YouTube. Why don't I use YouTube? Here we go. Maybe if I don't play it too loud. Probably in the background. Oh my God, there's a complete Conan the Barbarian music that's three hours and 17 minutes long. That's kind of awesome. Okay, but oh, I want I want to draw Conan. So of course I put my pencil down where I did not think. So look, I should put these pens back too. Hang on, my side table is getting super cluttered again. There's my pencil. All right, so I like the whole twisting shoulders, coming forward with the sword. Yeah, that's the Conan stuff. That does seem kind of loud, though. I don't want to get a strike, but maybe if I just subtly in the background. Let me know if you guys can still hear that. Public fangasm. <laughs> yes. Yes. I will I will fangirl all day long over Conan. Conan was one of the uh first fantasy uh books I ever really got into. I was actually reading the the Berkeley editions before I discovered uh the black and white savage sword book. So this is how I go about my figure, figure, figure construction. I bounce around a lot, paying attention to what I want to see. Make that head bigger. Also, don't know if I want to give him the fur diaper. I mean, he, he, I mean, if if you read the Conan stories, he he didn't wear a fur diaper. I mean, he sometimes wear a uh, loincloth, which is not a fur diaper. Um, but more often than not, he'd be described as wearing essentially shorts, uh, breeches, um, for ease of movement and everything. And I think I don't, this leg's coming like up and down vertical. I kind of want to drive him more forward. So let's get this leg. Oh, there, 
maybe. See, Basemo is a professional. He didn't do the Rob Liefeld thing where he hit both feet. He just hide one foot, so we didn't have to worry about him matching. Uh, my friend Silv was uh, saying, "I'm going to get." Oh, you can't hear the music. All right, turn it up just a bit, just enough to hear it. Let me know if that's loud enough. I want to give him a shield. A shield would be a nice touch or an axe. I never, uh, I got to tell you, I couldn't figure out how these boots worked out with like the, I mean, did they rip because you pulled them on and they were like socks, like leather socks? Uh, like you know wrap wrap the foot with some leather and uh oh well, maybe i'll put this down here oh a dagger there we go sword and dagger technique Okay, I think this is a pretty decent start. Uh, would I do this or in there? It's like rocky formations coming across like that. This is more or less what I want to draw. I don't know if if anyone actually wore those armbands. I know they they would wear like torques and stuff like that around their neck. Um, Yeah, I think this is, uh, is that fitting on the page well enough? Yeah, I think this is the start of what I want. So let me do another version with the next sheet of uh, Bond. 
if you guys have not seen how to drop comics the Marvel way, uh, let me see if I can pull out a copy. Do I have my copy handy? Here it is. So this is the book I was talking about earlier. And this type of drawing, um, I was already a sloppy bastard when it came to penciling um, at the start of things. But then I saw him build a figure. He showed how to do figure construction, but he, then he showed how to essentially do it by just being a messy bastard and, and, and almost like sculpting it, like adding and removing stuff as you needed. Let's see if I can find it. I think it's a drawing of Thor, if I remember correctly. Here it is, yeah. So this was his um, very Loomis-inspired uh, figure construction. So you basically get your mannequin, you, you flesh it out, and then you do the details. But then he did this, which was a much sloppier um, figure. So you're basically gesturing down the figure, then, then patting it out. Um, and Stanley going, never underestimate the importance of scribbling. Uh, and then, then getting it more correct. And this is this is obviously the way I work. Um, if you don't have this book and you want to learn to draw, this is a good book to get. Um, and of course, it goes flying on the floor. All right, my studio is going to be such a disaster after this weekend. Um, but this is enough for me to actually go and put it under the next layer. I want it to be higher up because you guys won't see the legs get drawn. So I'll just shorten the page. It'll be sitting up there mid camera. All right, great. Push the air out and it won't slide down. And put this down. Hold it fit there. That fits. All right, cool. It's a great book. The Jack Hand's the great, uh, the great follow-up book to it. The Drawing the Human Head and Figure. Uh, and once as a young artist, you 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 got a grasp on the Basema and the Jack Ham book, then I can't recommend uh, enough stepping up to both Andrew Loomis, which is gratefully back in print, and um, George Bridgman, who's always been in print and readily available, but not well enough known outside of the art community. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's sad. But George Bridgman and Andrew Loomis are the best. All right, so I have my basic figure here. I'm not happy with this leg yet. I don't want to draw with John Drew here, because uh, that works for him. That 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 type of construction, I can't make it work. Um, so I want to get that center line there. And so the pelvis will come down through there. So then. I'd be the femur, femur driving forward mechanically. I'd put it here at the front. Here, let me show you. Let me show you the, you know what? This might be cool. If anyone's interested, I am going to do this. If you're not interested, well, you're stuck. So there is a construction mannequin. This is the Loomis construction mannequin. I'm building underneath the figure, and it'll probably help me better sort out what I'm doing with this figure here. So I got a uh, pelvis, very simplified pelvis, uh, almost like a, um, a bowl with the sides cut off diagonally. I got his rib cage kind of twisting. So his, his uh, collarbones are going to come here and then shift up there. Um, so his spine's coming out here and the way the head's jutting forward, his head is very low in relationship to the rest of his body. Um, my scapula is going to be coming back in there. You know what, I'm gonna see a little bit more of his arm this way. So this is his back arm.
Maybe I'll pull it out to there. There we go. And then we'll have the hand. Oh, the tree of woe. There's the wheel of doom. What was it? The wheel of pain. Yeah, that's it. No, I want the hand straight. And it's coming down, so it's going to be that long. Yeah, well, I, I got this mostly right in the first pass here. So, all right, cool. And then we got the hand here. This, I want this driving back. This comes off center and goes back. The shin at the ankle. So I had this too far out, but it works now. Okay, this is now here, the patella. It's going to be off center. And then I want it to drive back. So ankle. Does this work? So we have the great Drew Canner. Medial vastus, outer vastus. No, I think it would be more like this. It would look a little bit more splayed, but it'd be more accurate to do it like that. So this would be more here. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure I've made that so messy people can't see what I'm doing. Yeah, it seems like it's got a little bit more forward momentum. Um, do I want this arm? So the shoulder muscle is going to be swinging right out of that. I think I want his wrist more open so we can see the knife in profile. I think that just reads better. I think that's a little bit better. You know, know what? Actually, this would be up higher. Here I am. I'm like fussing like crazy. And you just know that when Bashima do this, he just bang, laid it down. That's all he needed to do. He was just that good. Here I am, you know, decades later going, how, how was he such a genius? Oh, uh, he just was. Oh, maybe, you know, you know actually, it, it, if I get this line echoing this line, it just has more for, uh, forward drive. So let me just do this simplified. I'm probably going to end up doing like a, a third version as I, as I sort this stuff. Out.
yeah, this is feeling a little more accurate. So I'm going to give them like some sort of belt. this piece at all if you can hear the music i'm listening to <laughs> riddle of steel uh yeah it's um i gotta tell you i wasn't this thoughtful until i taught uh then teaching made me really really think about how i did everything so i could explain it better and um yeah so now i can't can't shake that shit off <laughs> still think i might actually even bring his leg back here and have it like really driving towards there we go Yeah, I'm definitely going to be doing it like another overlay on this once I'm. Uh... I don't want to like even make his shoulders a bit bigger. I mean, he's 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 fucking Conan, man. And, uh, put, like just go a little crazy with him every once in a while. Just like he's a monster. Like you know, you you, mess, you run into Conan, you know you're in trouble, even if he's happy to see you. I mean, he just wants. I just want him to look that freaking dangerous. Area, a classic like just straight dagger and not say X or anything like that just to that works a lot better to me might still tweak stuff a bit maybe maybe the problem is it's like even though I got the pelvis here maybe it should be the leg should be starting up here John had that right he had, had the leg starting back further it's coming towards and going away. Hmm. Let me think about that. Get rid of some of this graphite here. Sword would be coming out. So I've got a hilt going right through there. So the sword would be coming out like higher up in the arm than John drew. But then I get to do something different with it. All right, cool. 
So the sword's coming out like that. I'm making a mess of this leg. I have to need a new layer to figure out what exactly I'm doing here. I think this is when he gets freed. The music that's playing right now. It's not giving credit to what, what tune's playing where. We got his head. Not big enough. I can shave into it. It's pretty big. It's getting there. The nose is too low too, so which makes the mouse too low. Yeah, I can tweak this. His head's got to be a little bit higher, I think. Uh, so even if I did the shadow underneath here, I'd want the uh, reflected light. Okay, well, I'm getting there. <clears throat> Let me lighten where the sword is. Arms too long. Good. Get this. I don't like that leg. That works. Not too bad. A little more bounce in that shoulder to get, get the across the idea he's being pulling it back. Another knife there.
He said, I'm actually happy with that. Not happy with the legs. I, I, I try not to do what John did with his legs because he, he could do things with legs that aren't anatomically correct, but work amazing. I, I struggle when it comes to like messing around with that type of stuff. I, I kind of have to figure out, make sure I understand the anatomy. Um, put that there. Okay, let's do version number three. Well, actually, part of it might be that. Okay. Now, let me see if I can get the legs right before I waste any time on the upper figure here. So I think I want to twist more of the pelvis so this is coming down forward more. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to do that. So that comes forward. Yeah, I think this is already better. I mean, it may not be perfect, but it's already better than what I was <laughs> sporting around with there. There we go. Yeah, this is this is this is working significantly better. Just getting that leg driving forward. The foot maybe the shin might be still too short, but I can fiddle that one in a second. I think it might drop this arm even further just to, to push it more forward. So if I do that, then everything, everything drops more here. Yeah, that, that seems a little bit better.
think this is when they're robbing the serpent temple. All right, we're just about to hit six hours. So I'll be taking, um, wow, six hours. That's so cool. And I think the gel pack is stop the blurs. Knock on wood. Uh, maybe I'll run out to the grocery store and pick up a spare tomorrow just so I won't be, get caught short. That looks a little bit, a little bit more brutal of a knife. Yeah, I'm dropping the uh, sword further down, maybe just a quarter of an inch lower than what it was in the previous drawing, but it just seems to come forward more. up the arm so it actually emphasizes the stuff.
That feels more like a Conan face than the last one. Still not in love with that arm. Uh, I kind of like the sword running right back up visually, the length of the arm, bringing it forward. Um, otherwise, it comes too close to the face, and I have to twist the arm out to make it go outward more. I think this kind of leads into the shape more. This is going to be a silhouette foot now, because I'm really going to play down the top light. So... Um, there's going to be a core shadows running along all these surfaces. Uh, this is going to be in shadow. Might draw like an empty scabbard here. I oh, know, and that's a curved blade, so there's going to be like a sword there. There we go. Now you're going to want a shadow. Yeah, you know, I know it's a weird gesture, but it really does getting those legs splayed out like that really does something for Conan's power. So maybe I gotta maybe I really gotta bring that leg back out there. All right, this is what, number three? One, two, three, let's do it four. I gotta tell you, this is this is just the way I work. People who have seen me draw at conventions before have seen me do this a lot until I'm happy with it because I wanna be happy with it before I ink it. Oh, hey there. Yeah, I gotta tell you, I love I love Conan. Uh, tempted to pull up my Fison figure just to get it posed right. There's part of me that actually wants to go back and do that that super wide stance Conan, and like just literally have the. Uh, Yeah, I don't have to stick with these legs. Just twist like that, then this leg's coming forward.
I said, I got him. He's off balance. I do this right like there, back down. Or I could actually, you know, put it even more. Because he's so central, like sheer. So either I have the legs splayed to hold that that pose, or he's literally all his weight's going on this leg here in front of him. This can drop more here, go back there. Yeah, this, this feels like a better solution. It's not as dynamic as John, but I'm not as dynamic as John. Um, and this feels much more like he's, he's climbing out of something. Vinner wonders why sometimes it takes me forever to do a piece. It's because I'm doing this. Drawing after drawing after drawing after drawing until I'm happy with what I've sorted out. Still might twist this out a bit, put this over here. Yeah, that feels a little bit better. I think the solution for this arm is not that it's coming forward, but it's actually going, going more down the way now I brought this leg, I don't need to worry about the parallel to the arm to actually reinforce the action. I can actually have the, this arm coming down like that, paralleling this ang angle. I'm tempted to give him that shield again, because that, 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 would, that would create that curve that would actually match that kind of nicely. But the idea of a knife in his hand just feels more Conan the pirate type thing. Like he just stepped over a rock and he's just about to take out some guys who've been chasing him for a while. Oh, an axe in his hand on the sword would be kind of cool too. Yeah, I'm overthinking this.
Oh. Um, six hours. So I've taken 45 minutes off so far. Where's my next? Um, so I took a break of two hours. And 4.15. So then it's 6.45. All right. So I'm going to draw for another half hour and then take another break. I am going to give myself that half hour to get happy. Ooh, half broken sword. I like that. That, that, yeah. Okay. So this hands like that. I'm not certainly going to draw the Atlantean, um, the Atlantean sword because that's the one that broke, right? With his father's sword was the one that survived. It's been a couple of years since I watched Conan the Barbarian. Um, I got a beautiful Blu-ray restoration of it, but okay. So yeah, I think the Atlantean sword is the one that uh, survives because it shatters his father's sword, doesn't it? And um, and he uses his bro father's broken sword to decapitate Velsadu. I could be wrong. I might have to go rewatch it like immediately after doing this tonight. Okay, now the sword's coming out shallower. So it's coming out like that. that that's actually pretty good too. Go, coming back in the form is like what John did here. But I'm having it come more towards the viewer. So if I figure out the middle point. I get that more 3D thing happening. So angles actually, so that would be more like that. What am I doing? Yeah, I like that a lot. Thanks, Nick, for the uh, broken sword idea. That's that's perfect. Thing we gotta check here.
Sorry, just topping off my drink after I respond to something. Do the legs look short? It looks like the legs look a little short, don't they? Yeah, I, I keep making this harder for myself, don't I? Just looking at the screen, might be the angle of the camera. The forced perspective and everything. If I make that back like longer, yeah. Well, there will probably a, be a fifth version for me to just clean this crap up where I can enlong the leg, lengthen the legs. Yeah, this is this is too short. Might not uh, need to fix that in the next one if I just lengthen it now. So foreshortening stops me from showing how long this leg is, but this leg being that short. That's better. Get to here. Reaches, then this will be coming out like that. Knife. Yeah, this this is working a lot better. Thighs coming through there, shadow there, shadow there. He's coming over it. But there.
boy, George, I think I nailed it, finally. <laughs> now, how big is this? Uh, do I need to enlarge or reduce this one? Do the happy, uh, happy printed out on blue. Just remember, it's 12. Okay, that sits nice in the middle of that. And that sits there. So I'll just cut off that and that. That'd be a nice composition right there. All right. Let me do a, a cleanup tracing. And I think. This one will be good to ink. Here we go again. Yeah. Yeah, taking a break in about 15 minutes. Y'all don't mind.
yeah, this is starting to look more like what I can get at here. Crunch, crunch, crunch goes to spine. Sword sketched in before I start doing more anatomy. Pull my French curves out to finish that tip when I ink it, but it's good enough for pencils, I think.
shoulder in a bit. Wow, I just realized I haven't talked for a whole bunch of time. <laughs> It's like, oh yeah, taking a break 15 minutes. Silence. Sword is two, three days? Maybe. Thanks for the look. Uh I kind of like the broken sword idea though. I have I have not ever drawing Conan with a broken sword. So I think that's that's for me it's like, yeah, that's a great idea because I haven't done it before. So I think I, I think I'm gonna stick with it for that reason, if not nothing else. I think it, I think it's uh Actually, I had uh, earlier versions had the uh, had a dagger, and I uh, wasn't sure if the dagger was working. I do like the broken sword aspect? Maybe a little bit longer. Hang on, I can go to about here with that. Um, I could shorten the sword a bit if the 3D is bothersome. Um, I, I can undo some of the perspective, bring the tip back to about here. So it puts it like right in that kind of like scope. Let me, let me do a quick version of it lightly in here. Perspective on this side wouldn't change that much. So that's the tip. Like that. So that would be that. I, I got to say, I think I like the slightly more 3D aspect of it. Um, Hmm. 
I don't think I've ever drawn uh, Cyclops. I have drawn Daredevil a bunch of times. I love drawing Daredevil. Um, actually, the sword is way off center here. This is the center line coming out, and I drew the sword completely off the center line. No, it's still too high up. This is way too perspective -y. It's too far away to have that much force perspective. I'm going to make the uh, top edge. I can still go out to here, all right. I do think, how's this for a compromise? I'm gonna make it a little narrower but have it still come out that far. New center point for this narrower sword is going to be from there till there, I think. Excuse me. Well, I kissed the sky. Tip is still too large. Let's shave that back. The less obnoxious uh, so coming out it's a little too pointy. I like the broken sword, but now it's actually doing weird things directionally. Uh, I think I'm going to go back to him holding the dagger, but having the dagger pointing back. Because that was that was pretty close to where I was happy. But the broken sword idea appeals so much, man. Such a great idea. But I think... Monster. 
Yeah, holding the dagger facing backward ties it the figure better together. Together better. Ugh. All right. Okay, I think this is ten page. And it's time for like another 15 minutes. Okay, so I am going to take a, uh, I'm going to scan this, print it out, and then I'm going to take a 15 minute break. Take this drawing up to find so it's a little more clear. Yeah. And uh, actually, yeah, yeah, I think this is, I think this is it. This will fit in the nine by 12 really nicely. And uh, I can do the reflected light. That's going to be, it's going to be all black here. Uh, in terms of reflected light. Oh, shit, I didn't do the shadow. The way I wanted to. Hang on, hang on. Getting ahead of myself. I'm so eager to grab a small bike so I didn't grab lunch last break. And here we go. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Shadow there, shadow there, and I want a hand coming there, and yeah, that's that's where I want my shadows. There we go. Okay. So yeah, let me let me scan that, get it printed out, and when I come back from my break, I'll ink it. It'll probably be the last piece I finish today. I'll very likely, if there's time after I finish Conan, I'll work in the, one of the Batman paintings. Well, I don't have a problem with you know art looking comic booky, but especially since I've just been raving about uh, Andrew uh, um, John Bashima. Uh, I clearly got a certain comic book DNA in my I pushed all of these things. Import. Oh wow, okay. Um may have less time to do Batman paintings than I plan to this week. Uh I just picked up another what my seven game.
think it's a nine by 12. Let's talk, all right. That worked. Yeah, motor shoot and knife die. Over there, didn't I? I'm going to grab it from over there. This is Bellum. Print. Have since. So I'm going to ink that as soon as I get back from my break. Yay. I'll see you guys in 50 minutes. You know, I should put a note up. Uh, so over here, grab my chunky marker. Um, hmm. I was going to write it there, but I shouldn't. Um, I wonder if it'll show up right here. That show up at No, it doesn't. <laughs> Let me find a piece of scrap paper. Here we go. And I shouldn't say just 15 because no one knows when they start looking. So, fun. Taking off now at 6.06. Uh, I'll be back by 6.30. I think I need a slightly little longer break here. Uh, just to uh, do a few things that are piling up. All right, I'll see you guys at 6 30.
And I'm back. Ready to ink this Conan for the last 90 minutes of the stream today. Pretty sure I'll get it done. Um, I'm just actually part of why I'm, I'm slow jumping in front of that is I thought the gel pack was a lifesaver in terms of keeping that weird pulsing. So I'm ordering to get delivered tonight to make sure I got extra gel packs tomorrow in case anything goes wrong. Um, I'm actually getting them delivered now. <laughs> so they, they'll, they'll arrive after the stream's done. Um, uh, and done, I think. Yeah, we'll arrive around 9.30 tonight. All right, cool. Let's get going. This is uh, really fun. I got to tell you, I love Conan. Uh, how many times can I say I love Conan? I love Conan. Um, hopefully, before I die, I get to do a Conan project. That would be sweet. And the person who commissioned this piece actually asked for this drug. So I'm going to actually I'm gonna just clean this up because the residual sword is bothering me. Part of the reason it's there is because it came through on the other side, too. You know? There? Yeah, yeah. Pretty much all gone. All right. So I'm going to pack this up to go with the, uh, the piece when it's done. And speaking of which, here it is. Ooh, a nice vellum bristol. Uh, you know what? I'm going to start with the eyes. Because if I screwed these up, then I'd just be running back and printing, printing it again. Actually, am I blocking that? I, I was leaning in really, really hard because my body's tired. Um, Just want to make sure everyone can see the detail of this. Oh, it's pulsing again, isn't it? Hmm? Well, it pulsed. Anyway. If it starts doing this kind of focus, out of, out of focus, in focus, out of focus thing again, uh, that might be a sign for me to end a little bit early. Because um, I don't want to burn out the camera after I just got it. And that's why I ordered uh, uh, additional gel packs for cooling because this this is gel pack still on it, and um, it's not cold anymore. which is not a good sign for something that's supposed to keep stuff cold. It's no longer cold. Sorry, I don't want to cough near the mic. 
I think that would be kind of crass and contagious, maybe, technology being the way it is. Get cough and give you all the virus. Checking for pulsing again. Not paranoid that my camera's going to burn out like almost immediately. I'm going to jump to a one. <clears throat> More zing for the throat tonight. You know what I kind of want to get? There you go. I like that a little bit better. Oh, and uh, the guy asked me to draw Cyclops because I haven't drawn him before. Yeah, I love your second choice. <laughs> I haven't drawn Daredevil in... I have drawn... I drew Daredevil at a con about two years before the pandemic. Um, there was a weird spate where I got like seven or eight Daredevil commissions in a row, and then nothing since. It's weird. Um, I think it may be because of the TV show. Uh, the TV show made him uh, super popular again, and people were asking me to do Daredevil. So that was, uh, I would have been just as happy to do either of them. Because uh, I am excited for uh, Daredevil coming back, obviously. Mike. Take a little bit of white paint and just raise the eyeball a little bit here to, to make it more of a snarl.
Oops. Just as I looked up, it was like a weird kind of out of focus, in focus thing, and that might be just because I moved my hand. Three.
I want to get that sense of uh, reflected light coming up on the side of Conan. I just realized how quiet I got again. I'm like so into inking this. I'm just like literally like fading out. All right, here we go. Yeah, I gotta tell you, I I like Cyclops. He's so rarely done well. Um, there's something about um. I, I also think it's bizarre how they made him so muscular because I mean his nickname started as Slim. But I mean, I, it's really hard to get behind a guy who was the best student you know what i mean where it's like um uh he was he was really just professor x's best student and uh even that was taken away from him by uh by his girlfriend <laughs> Yeah, that's a little better. Those cheekbones are starting to bother me. I have one way too low. Yeah, because I, I think Cyclops has been done dirty way too often in comics. Um, and they actually, if I remember correctly, didn't they just recently make him a villain for a while? Which is, you know, that's like the last ditch effort to how do you how do you make a, a hero interesting is well let's make them bad well that, that tells me a lot of people a lot of people fa failed to actually do scott justice there Started to ramble there a bit about uh, Cyclops. Oh, here we go. What's more stuff? More stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta tell you, um, Grant Morrison's run in X Men had some of the best ideas. It, it was to me, it was an often incoherent storyline. But he ended up coming up with some of the best ideas for these characters that had ever been done. And the best student with the baddest girl worked for me. I mean, that that became like one of the best Cyclops arcs. And it was entirely making him making you realize he can make a relationship work with with the woman that dangerous. Yeah, I, I uh, that's. That's really my favorite take of him. It was where it's like he was the the uh, the chosen disciple of Professor X, but he saw Magneto's side. And honestly, um, I like Magneto as um, well. I guess I guess it's kind of like the whole you know Martin Luther King uh, um, Malcolm X thing. Uh, I like Magneto as the Malcolm X to uh, Professor X's uh, king. It, it just that just works for me. Um, it allows X Men to stay political, which they've always been, and it does so in a way that more people can grasp and is actually still incredibly relevant. Anyway, that's that's my opinion on that part.
build those tones so they actually yeah i think i cut the reflected light coming up here so that's good Yeah, I, I I feel that the X Men movies, in a very realistic way, simplified the mutant versus humanity discourse to the point where people don't really connect with it. Um, I mean, Claremont knew what he was doing. I mean, the God Love Men, God Love Men Kills, graphic novel was very much about equating. The history of anti-Semitism, which is again on the rise, um, with uh, the mutant phobia, and uh, I think the current issues with the the new rise of the far right. I, I think X Men should return to being aggressively political about social and political commentary, uh, in pushback to like all those those people who just think that superheroes are supposed to be pointless entertainment. I have my opinions here, obviously. Sorry, just checking because I I ordered uh placed that order and normally they start getting ready to deliver like when they say they are, but they're actually shopping now and I'm like, uh, uh okay. As long as they don't arrive before the stream's uh scheduled ending. I I'm I'm fine with that. I wanna finish this tonight. Then I'm gonna jump on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I gotta say, I, I bet if more people read those, those, uh, particularly the, uh, the Claremont era X-Men and understood it, uh, we might have less of this because I mean, if anything, those comics gate idiots, uh, running around saying, well, comics aren't supposed to be political. Um, it's really clear they weren't reading the comic books that we were. <laughs>
I always figure when Conan is urban, like like when he's living in the mega cities, he's like spending his ill-gotten gains on everything. So I figured he'd have like, you know, uh belts and, and necklaces and of, of jewels and stuff. And as soon as he's about to like, you know, go live in the woods and fight picks, it's like all that shit's gonna go. I mean, it's 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 gonna be uh um he knows how to be quiet. But I figure in the city full of noise, he's like, yeah, okay, I can wear this shit. That's why I got like these weird little things here. I also figured it would be almost like a coinage. Like if you, you could wear like um, a whole string of like silver beads and each bead is equivalent of like, uh, I don't know, five bucks. And, uh, you know, you pay someone with a bead. You just un un untie one end of it, give them a bead. Anyway, I did shit like that when I was playing D&D. The dumb players, it's like, this is your currency. It's, it's a whole bunch of strings of beads. Here's gold beads, silver, copper, that type of thing. Yes, D&D nerd, that was me. Oh, I played, um, I actually got into the Wizards of the Coast Star Wars was my gaming group back when I had a gaming group. Um, Star Wars is is bonkers fun. Um, I'm, I'm amazed that uh, it's had to struggle a few times finding a publisher for uh, for that universe. I mean, it's just Jedi everything. It's just... Of course, a whole bunch of people wanted to play a, a Gungan Jedi. Misa strong with the Force. Um, luckily, luckily, we all relented and decided not to. But even Star Wars, Star Wars is intensely political, and I'm always weirded out when people don't see it. We have all this art that 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 shows us, you know where we're falling short and so many people are like no no it's just it's just you know it's 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 just beat up the bad guy stuff and i'm like what just don't get some people man I mean, and the Empire was the Nixon administration. <laughs> uh, eight hours streaming, man. This is, I'm, I'm really enjoying streaming. I hope you guys are enjoying watching me doodle away. Um, 
I am very much likely going to do this again. Um, even if it's like pick a night and I'll start doing like regular, just live art streaming, like just one commission a week or something. Um, and, uh, I'm also going to be doing a lot more stuff on my Patreon video. I think I'm going to do uh, exclusive behind the scenes, how I draw stuff, how I ink stuff, talk in more detail about the process. Uh, pretty much everything, whatever people want, I'll do. Well, within limits. I mean, I think there's specialists on Patreon to do that stuff. Sorry, I'm just getting like really picky. I can I can make that better. Um, I don't know. I I used to do. I mean, um, if plans didn't go sideways this year, I would have been at uh, C2E2 right now. Um, that's part of the reason why I, part of the, the entire inspiration was like, shit, I should be at Chicago this weekend and I'm not, uh, just everything kind of didn't go as planned in terms of like scheduling. And I can do, I can do a con pretty easily, especially a busy one like C2E2. Um, um, and I, I've, I really wanted to get into streaming art in a, in a serious way for quite some time. Um, and, uh, do, 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 do. why did I get a notification here? Okay. never mind. Um, and I, I ended up, this just ended up becoming like the best opportunity to, to, to combine everything. Um, would I do a marathon three day? Like I'm, I'm doing this tomorrow, but not as long. I'm doing it till like five central, I believe. So that'd be like six o'clock Eastern. Um, uh, yeah, I can I can do this. I can do it easier if someone else is with me. So um, the idea is the next major convention that I would have gone to, uh, I have to look in the calendar, uh, find a buddy of mine, either from my art rep or just one of my friends, and uh, perhaps someone to moderate. So there's someone else asking questions. And we'll use um, OBS or some other uh, software so we can actually chat more, like uh, have the artists talk together and uh, have someone who's actually looking at chat and saying, oh, hey, you know, Richard, here's a question for you. Or, you know, my friend Mike or someone else uh, saying, here's a question for you. Um, and, and that way uh, it could be more interactive and the weight wouldn't necessarily be on me to do all the talking. Um, I'm actually uh, amazed I've, I've managed to avoid, uh, dead air as often as I have. It's, it's now it's, I think it's towards the end of the day where, uh, I got tired and I just like, oh, I'm really enjoying this drawing and I just want to draw. I don't want to talk, <laughs> but if there's like, um, 
you know, a host and one to three or four other artists. And it wouldn't necessarily have to do the whole weekend either. It's like they could say, okay, I'll do, I'll do Saturday. Someone else will do Sunday. Someone else will do Friday with me. Um, I actually think that's turning out pretty good. I like it. All that, all those redrawings paying off. Um, being able to have a number of guys, I think my art rep might, might, uh, help out more there in terms of like maybe we'll get some other artists from cadence to participate and i think that would be i think that would be great that'd be really smart for my uh my art rep to do that um i want that sorry i just want to concentrate on these these kind of like leather wrap gauntlets on conan's arms here um because then then it becomes they can handle all the uh the commissions that come in for all the artists who are on it's like so then the other artist doesn't have to try and figure out like okay well, how am i gonna know when someone's paying me for for something um i just think that's just you know smart to get it all in one squad of people handling it and uh i might actually use a little bit of zip do a bit of a fade mask up everything but the blade and just have like a little mechanical zip uh coming down here and just just make it catch that that reflected light. So yeah, I mean, I'd love for um, oh god, like I, one of my favorite people, uh, favorite two people, uh, wrapped by Cadence are Chris Mitten and Aaron Campbell. I, I think it would be so easy with three of us and someone who's actually catching all the comments to um, to keep us going. And it's like you know the artists could ask each other questions too. And I think that would be even more interesting. There could be like a quasi uh, professional confab happening uh, right during this, this little virtual convention. Yeah. I, I, you know what, looking at this, I'm really happy. There was some push on um, the size and width of the sword. Um, I think, I think this is the narrower sword feels like it's a little more distant. It's going to allow me to do some stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to put some like values and stuff back here. Let's get there. some more hair happening here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm distracting myself from, you know, talking about the stuff I was talking about. <laughs> oh, see what? Yeah, Andrew and Paolo, and I was supposed to, I guess, connect with Corey this weekend, but Andrew stepped up, and even though he's on vacation, he's doing all the stuff, uh, which which is, you know, oh, my God, that's, that level of dedication Andrew has for this job. It's, it's so awesome. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think it would be, I think it would be smart. I got, like, friends who don't, aren't rep by Cadence, and I'd, I'd happily do stream with them. But if 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 it was like uh, what's the next big show? Um, let's say we did Heroes. We do Heroes at home, and three or four people who aren't going to Heroes, we all team up, and we don't necessarily all of us have to do every day. Um, it it becomes a a, a good treat for the people who also can't go to Heroes. It's like you 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 got three captive artists, three or four captive artists who are who are just doing work. And commissions, and you get to watch them. I just, I, I just think that would be uh, a nice bit of not necessarily counter programming. I used that word before, and I, it, it's, it kind of gets across what I mean. But what I really mean is, there are people who can't go to Heroes and wanted to go to Heroes. There are people, there are artists who wanted to go to Heroes and aren't going to Heroes. Um, you know, and Heroes is busy running Heroes. So what if the people, those people kind of come together and do uh, an online thing together? And I'm, I'm perfectly happy if my art rep after this takes the lead on it and it becomes a cadence thing specifically, because then you know, I still get to do it. So. Although I don't know if they'll let me listen to Conan nonstop like I am. 
maybe if we all all of us got Conan commissions at the exact same time, that would be kind of awesome if we all got like a gang of commissions to start and finish like an art duel. Oh my God. We have multiple artists. We can actually say, okay, starting Saturday afternoon at this point, we put aside whatever commissions we're doing and we have two hours to draw X. I think that would be, I, that would be fun. Maybe I'm weird that way. They did, yeah. They, a lot of a lot of companies did online film festivals, uh, and I think that was brilliant. Um, and there was there was sort of some online conventions. I know I did some like uh, interviews um, because of of COVID, because all the conventions were done really. Um, This hand happening here. Um, and I, I, I think I've been talking, my, the con experience has changed dramatically in the last couple of years mainly i think because of covid but it was, it was already happening if 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 you're a regular at comic conventions you know that the vast majority of people showing up are showing up for celebrities or just to gawk and maybe spend a little bit of money on those weird items because conventions themselves have, have become dramatically expensive i mean i remember it used to be you know spend 10 bucks you can see everything in the convention but now because there's all the celebrities there and they, they need big bucks just to show up, conventions have to charge like 30, 40 bucks a day. I mean, it's madness. Um, so I have a feeling like there, I, I don't know if the people who are really, really serious about just buying art are going to really be con regulars anymore. And, um, yeah, and I still, I love conventions. I really do. I, I, I think they're a great experience. I love meeting new people. Uh, I love seeing, um, friends that I've made over the years. Cause that's sometimes that was the only time you see them. But when you plan to do 10 to 12 shows a year, it's exhausting. It really is. And, um, in hindsight, let me just look in the mirror. See how this is. Yes, it's coming together all right. Um, I I think the idea that okay, you know what? Instead of doing like ten to twelve shows a year, I'll do four. I'll do four shows that I haven't done in like two three years, and I will do four online events, and that way, I I still get to do. I don't want to say fan service isn't really it, but it's like I get to show my art, my skill, and my craft uh, to an audience that may not have seen it before. Because you know, there's a lot of people who there's always new fans, um, but there's also it's like this opportunity to show the work and do the commissions on demand in this very very specific method. Yeah, scabbard and that scabbard. Well, you know what? That scabbard would show up there, but I don't think it would. Um, so saying as someone who loves going to conventions, loves seeing these cities, I, I think the time of doing like eight or nine shows a year 
is is not not a good use of time anymore. Um, I have a feeling there might be we might see artists only conventions. Um, that might that might happen uh, because we're we're in a situation where comic conventions, so many of them barely have comic content nowadays. They're media shows that use the term. And uh, I, for one, I'm not a big fan of that. I'm not a big fan of uh, shows that headline wrestlers and um, people who were uh, accidentally cast in the zombie show, uh, and, and they're the only people they advertise, and they call themselves a comic show. Um, maybe I'm a bit of an asshole for that. But um, I don't begrudge, you know, actors and wrestlers and everything meeting their fans. But didn't they already have like sports card shows and everything that could have been taken over by that? Am I wrong? Um, uh, I'd like to see comics art festivals. I mean, we got TCAF, the Toronto Comics Art Festival, and it's a it's a monster zoo. And it really is only comics, which is great. But oh my God, is it overwhelming? I would like to see uh, a comics art event gallery showing. You know, if I want a, a stupid amount of money, this is what I'd do. I would I would host a comic art festival with a gallery show, and uh, every year I invite five to ten massive talented artists, like big names, five to ten. Um, Standard artists, I think, deserve recognition for their quality of their work, but they don't seem to get it. And five to ten up and comers, and I, I would cap it at at like twenty artists. So that's you know you're juggling everything, and it would be connected with a gallery show. So and the gallery show would be for a week before and a week after the event, and but there'd be a weekend where all the artists would be in town. And we would have, um, I guess, Artist Alley, um, panels, Q&As, um, retrospectives. And we put out a catalog of, of the gallery show. So imagine if, if I did the show and I got, one year I got um, uh, Bill Sienkiewicz, Garcia Lopez, uh, Alex Ross, uh, Mike Mignola, and Walt Simonson as the legends. Um, and then we get Olivia Coipel, um, uh, Stuart Eminen, uh, Terry Nord, uh, a couple other like really, really standard big guys, uh, maybe Jim Lee, stuff like that. And then we'd have like a panel that would pick what we think are the best five to 10 up and comers from the last five years. The people who entered the industry in the last five years and they do astounding work and they deserve the profile and each of them give us 10 pieces suddenly you got a 100 page art book that goes hand in hand with an art festival you have a gallery show which of course immediately draws a little more attention and it's comics and it's comics as in many ways the way the europeans look at where it's it's it is art i don't know maybe 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 it's time for something like that, more events like that. I mean, it's like, and you wouldn't have to have just one a year. You could have, you know, you could have the New York version. You could have the LA version. You could have the Toronto version. And um, they would always be going after different artists, different things. It's like, well, let's, let's, let's go after silver, silver age artists who might still be alive and just do a gallery show of just those people. I, I think that would be fascinating. Uh, yeah, TCAF is creator focused. Uh, I don't know if I mean like um, I mean Jim Zub is there every year. He does Gangbusters, and he is an artist. Uh, but lately, he's primarily working as a writer, and and I, I'm not saying that to any any sort of like any sort of like this. What what it mean? What I mean is. He's more of a creator than just specifically an artist. And I think I think creators like Jim, who are like do diverse good work consistently, they're gonna probably 
do well at TCAF better than somebody who just draws pretty. That makes sense. I hope that makes sense because I'm not trying not to slight anyone. And I, I picked on Jim because you know I think he does some amazing work. And I still want to work with Jim. All right. I kind of still want to just do that little bit of zip. Hmm. I, I want to do this with a French curve, though. I don't want to muck up the tip of the sword by freehanding it. Put chips in the blade and everything because you've been killing people with it. Hang on, give me one second here. Check something. I got this rock here. Sorry, I just had to. I got a whole bunch of shopping notices from that order I placed while I was on 15 minute break there. And I just wanted to make sure they weren't going to deliver like now. All right. So I got the rock going this way. I kind of want to have a rock echoing the sword. I can throw some shadows in that. And I kind of want a rock going like that. Do the counter close to that. So maybe do a rock like across and a rock like that. I gotta make a mine fast because you know we're we're done in a few minutes. <laughs> Month that sword to pump. So let me let me do the rock there. So we're gonna have that there. Rock's gonna come back there. So we're gonna do shot. All right, and then I'm going to yeah, that's how, that's how I think I think I want these shapes happening here. I just want them to pop more from the background, so thus rocks.
is this like a loop? Because that's like the second or third time we heard the end uh, end credits music. I am a little disappointed that none of them have played Mako's voiceover yet. No, Prince, but in the time when the oceans drank Atlantis. That would be cool. All right, Nick, uh, see you later. If not later, I'll hopefully see you tomorrow um, on again at uh, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Um, so, yeah, have a good time. Thanks for hanging out so much and uh, I'll see you tomorrow, hopefully or later. Yeah, you know what the black? I don't know if the sword needs the zipaton that I wanted to put on it before. going to do some smoke, but I think solid blacks will make all the rendering pop even more. Yeah, I, th I think that's the case. So what I'm going to do is, you know, I am going to do a lot more brush work in the stone to get really, really get that stone across. I also want to. Really, really enhance the weight of uh, stone here in the front. Let me tape off the important areas and I get to hit this with my big black Sharpie. Oh, I think, oh my God, did it finally finish? Wow. All right. So that was Conan. Watch it. Watch it get my uh, my whole stream killed. One, one, two, 
you know, just to be on the safe side, I'm going to pull the brushing a little bit away from the details. Just to make it safer. Got something off my drawing table that I should put on my shelf. Countdown, how much time left? What time is it? 7.35, 25 minutes. I can do this in 25 minutes. I won't be able to start uh, Cyclops yet, but uh, I might actually. This is a weird thing. This is a weird experience I always used to have at conventions. Uh, the last night of the show, I don't sleep. It's, um, I don't know why. It's, uh, it's just, maybe I'm strange. But uh, so a lot of times I'll show up on my last day, all my commissions are done uh, because I couldn't sleep. I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, I, I didn't ask you, Alexa. Um, I don't know what sets her off. Why she asks certain questions the way she does. She's a complicated woman, that Alexa. Yeah, I love this big black paint marker it means i get to, i remember oh my god for years people say never use a sharpie never use a sharpie yeah because you know it, it's terrible for any sort of preservative ele elements of the work um but then sharpie actually puts out a good line of uh paint markers and they're like well i guess i'm using sharpie and I, do i want another no i think i'm just going to do detail rock fall down here. Do want to have some counter detail so the sword pops more against that. One to one.
some sort of underground cavern rocks weirdly formed. Thanks, Stacy. Uh, rocks, rocks aren't easy. I mean, you got to draw a lot of rocks to get good at drawing rocks, which is true about everything. But it's like rocks, natural forms of rocks, and all that stuff. It's like you gotta, you gotta figure it out. You gotta, yeah, you know, sit down. You gotta look at a bunch of different. Uh, either you gotta look at how different artists draw rocks, and then you know, steal from them, um, or you do the thing I did, and you 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 get all those. You know, you go to magazine places that still carry old magazines like National Geographic, and you get a bunch of stuff that has like you know rock drawings and stuff, and you draw them, man. Yeah, just draw them. I'm going to go in with a little bit of brush on the hair here. I want to, I want to go something more solid black here against the uh, the gray value I created in the rocks back here. I want them to still pop. I like the white coming down through here. In fact, I'm going to leave a lot of the rock shapes here white. I'll let this be uh, more contrasty. So I want that white shape coming down through here. So I'm going to be doing a lot of shadow on the rocks here. Because it really, it makes that sword pop without me having to do like some sort of weird other shape elements. might do a little bit of white paint just up here because there's so, such an obvious like light source coming from the top i feel that maybe i should strengthen the highlight on this hair not on the sword or any of the more traditional items but really get across that sense of light that's happening up here
think this pen's almost dead. Which is, you know, not necessarily a bad thing. Every pen needs a time to die. I mean, it's just it's just like Bond. Bond's dead. Oh yeah, this is dying big time. almost dry already like a, a drop or two here
don't have to use that for that. Now that take a little bit of that edge off. A little bit more brush block and uh, and around his face to make it pop a bit more. I think this one's done. Mm -hmm. You know what? Just a little bit more tweaking here. Yeah, I think that's done. 
All right. Um, it is wow. It's it's time to wrap. <laughs> Just as my camera starts throbbing again. Um, although it's is it hot? Yeah, it's kind of warm. Um, so this is probably the best time to jump off. And there's only five minutes left in the planned stream anyway. So let me remove the tape so we can actually see the piece in its final form. See if it pops as much as I hope it would uh, with this black I've added. And uh, maybe I want just a little bit more in here. There we go, that works. That's doing what I want it to do now. All right. I think Conan, man, starting with like looking at Conan drawing by Bashema and ending up so far away. Ah, uh, kind of cool. Over here, pull up the paint marker again and give her a sig. All right, I'm actually really, really happy with how this Conan turned out. All right. I'm going to scan it and post it. And I will see you all tomorrow. Take care. Good night.